If I fail, it is only because I have too much pride and ambition. The words of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar is considered by many to be one of the greatest political and military leaders of all time. He won election after election against other politicians who often had more wealth and power, and he won battle after battle, even when he was often outnumbered by his enemies. He also won the hearts and minds of the Roman people during a time when the nobility was generally despised. Caesar was born into the noble Caesar family, but didn't have nearly as much wealth or influence in the Roman Republic as many other noble families. Caesar was born during the final stages of the Republic, when the government was full of violence and corruption. He was also, from an early age, very ambitious. As a teenager, Caesar began making advantageous alliances with other Roman nobles. He wanted to have a career in politics, and he would claw his way to the top. In 60 BCE, Caesar would form the first triumvirate, an alliance with two other powerful politicians that would change Roman history. Caesar used the triumvirate to secure the consulship, one of the highest positions in Rome, and governorship of Gaul. Caesar would successfully defeat the Gallic tribes and conquer Gaul for Rome and make a lot of money and establish his fame in the process, and it still wasn't enough power or prestige for him. When he read about what Alexander the Great had accomplished by the same age, he felt like a failure and literally wept. It was never enough for Caesar. He was like the star of a Shakespearean tragedy, pushed ever forward by vaunting ambition, constantly trying to fill a hole inside of him that could never be filled. And then when Caesar's allies turned on him and ordered him to lay down his command, he refused. The Senate turned against him. So he turned his vaunting ambition back towards Rome and crossed and marched back into a civil war. He emerged victorious as dictator of Rome in 46 BCE, initially a dictatorship with a term limit, but that wasn't enough. He wanted more. He wanted to be named dictator for life. And in January of 44 BCE, he got his wish. And then the Senate really turned against him. Some of them enough of them. Caesar was assassinated on March 15th, 44 BCE by a group of senators who worried that he would now crown himself king and destroy the Senate and their democracy forever. Today, we'll get to know one of the most enduring names in all of human history, Julius Caesar, once a little known noble who would romance an Egyptian queen and become dictator of Rome. Today, we'll discuss the end of the Roman Republic, Julius Caesar's life, political conflicts, his assassination in this historical, I don't know which words I'm going to mess up this week, but I know I'm going to mess up a lot of words. For the glory of Rome, historical, biographical, check this motherfucker out, edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, meat sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, the suck master, Italiano master class and instructorino, a butcherer of Latin, and you are listening to Time Suck. Uh, Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. Uh, Another big summer camp announcement. I will try and keep as short as possible today. Holy shit, this week sucked, destroyed my brain. Uh, Big props to teachers and professors who cover the Roman Republic. Just Just a wee bit of information to wrap one's mind around. Uh, looking forward to sharing what I have wrapped my mind around this week with you uh, before I make my announcements here. Uh, I'll, apologize, uh, I'll apologize that there was no dick in last week's suck. Not a single Richard. Didn't realize that until after I recorded. What a bummer. How tragic. I got excited for a second. I thought maybe Raffaele was Italian for Richard. Now Ricardo is. But not one fucking Ricardo, huh? Uh, sure hope at least a little bit of dick shows up this week. Maybe, maybe some daddy dick. <laughs> That'll make sense soon, I promise. Uh, and again, much quicker with the announcements this week. Uh, Space Lizards, listen to The Secret Suck for more details on this year's summer camp, or at least check your Patreon posts uh, for where to go this Wednesday, January 18th at noon. Campers from last year, check that Facebook post uh, in the uh, in the camp group on Facebook. Check your emails. Tickets on sale for you the day this drops, noon Pacific time. And then Friday at noon, everyone can go to badmagicmerch.com to click the banner to head on over to the camp ticket site. At least watch the little promo video we made for it. God, I love it. Nice cuts from last year with cuts of the current camp we're going to. And and there will still be tickets as of this Friday. I I will be shocked if they're all gone by then. I highly doubt that just based on the number of people who went last year, the capacity we have for this year. uh, I'll know more next episode. Um, Also, thanks to anyone who came out to the Spokane shows uh, to kick off the Burn It All Down theater tour. I'm recording this just before that show, 
Boise shows uh, looking sold out for this weekend. Excited for those. And then Kansas City trending towards selling out. I think the St. Louis show is already sold out. Then off to Sacramento, had that added show there. Denver, may not be tickets for Denver. Then San Antonio, Dallas, and more. Our tickets in Texas. Come on, Texas! Uh, DanCummins.tv for tickets. And uh, Vancouver, sorry that that show has been canceled. I will explain later why the uh, show is no longer. All the other shows are good. Don't worry about the rest of those. Uh, Vancouver tickets will be refunded. If you don't get uh, uh, refunded, just contact the venue. It's just a bit lengthy to explain now. Uh, but essentially, I'm, uh, I'm one of Canada's most wanted criminals. Uh, no, but <laughs> I went over this week's Secret Suck, and pro- I, I will provide more details on a future episode. Right now, I need every brain cell I have left. For Caesar. Uh, <laughs> this week kicked my ass. Both kids' birthdays were the week of this uh, prep and recording. Happy birthday again, Monroe and Kyler. Monroe had two basketball games. You know, uh, prepped three episodes of scared to death. Uh, then a lot of summer camp stuff for the wet out bad magic summer camp this September. So excited. Uh, a lot of sleep was lost. This monkey tired, but also fired up on caffeine. And then I'll sleep tonight. Nice. And then one more thing, a tech update real quick. Uh, for anyone experiencing episodes skipping around, we did find out from our contact, Devin, the external distribution manager at Stitcher podcast, the man who oversees our RSS feed and knows a lot about this shit, that the issue is not with the feed, but rather the app you listen to in all likelihood. Tends to happen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. It comes up here and there. It's happened for a few years on a lot of different podcasts. In short, it's just a streaming problem with the app that can be solved by downloading episodes and listening to them that way uh, or reinstalling your app. And if those two solutions do not work, just message us and we will look further into it. But that seems to have fixed it for everybody we've talked to so far. And that's it. And now, as they say in Italian, macaroni, mazzarate, facci, terrelasso, a Bugatti sees a salad of golden girls, a bada bing, a Cleopatra's a spice of meatball, I wish I was eating a maple bottle for some reason, muy bien, forget about it. That was Italian for a quick preview of Caesar, uh, then an overview of the government of the Roman Republic, and then a timeline of Caesar's life. Let's fucking go! Becky Little, writing for History.com, wrote the following of the Roman Republic Caesar was born into. Imagine a world in which political norms have broken down. Senators use bad faith arguments to block the government from getting anything done. An autocrat rigs elections, gives himself complete control over the government. Even stranger, many voters subscribe to the autocrat's personality cult and agree that he should have absolute control. Welcome to Rome in the first century BCE. The republic that had existed for over 400 years had finally hit a crisis it couldn't overcome. Rome itself wouldn't fall, but during this period, it lost its republic forever. According to Edward J. Watts, author of Mortal Republic, How Rome Fell into Tyranny, the Roman Republic functioned so well as a system of government for centuries because there were established political norms and there was no violence, land theft, or capital punishment at least not within Rome's political processes itself. And then that would change. In 133 BCE, three decades before Caesar's birth, Rome experienced the first political murder in the history of the Republic. Tiberius Gracchus, an elected official, tried to redistribute land for the poor. He was seeking a second term. But when a fight broke out between his followers and opponents, he was beaten to death with wooden chairs. Sounds like a rough way to go. Uh, Senators then helped uh, uh, murder almost 300 of his followers. And you know what? Fucking good. Of course they did. What the fuck was he thinking? Land for the poor? (laughs) What a crazy notion. What would they even do with land? They're poor. They'll just litter it with busted up chariots and dirty eyed uh, or dirty dull eyed kids. What's a dirty eyed kid? I should have just ran with that. You know, you know, you know how poor people have dirty eyed kids. (laughs) With all their, that's what helps them stay poor is they can't fucking see anything because they just live in filth and it's just covering their eyeballs. Ah, uh, but seriously, uh, not surprised when he was killed by a bunch of uh, wealthy arist- aristocratic senators. They didn't want to help the poor. Uh, now things started to get a bit more chaotic in Rome, especially because starting just a handful of years before Caesar was born, the way Rome uh, redefined its military will really shake things up in a way that will make the Republic unsustainable and set Rome on a path of changing from a Republic to an empire. Just made it inevitable, I think. Uh, Julius Caesar was born in the middle of a chaotic period of the Roman Republic and his death, and more importantly, how he personally shook shit up in his final years before his death would help bring about the end of the Republic. Adrian Goldsworthy, 
not just going to do a suck full of uh, book quotes, by the way, but wrote in his 2006 book, Caesar, Life of a Colossus, Life of a Colossus. He was a politician and statesman who eventually took supreme power in the Roman Republic and made himself a monarch in every practical respect, though he never took the name king. In his 56 years, he was at times many things, including a fugitive, prisoner, rising politician, army leader, legal advocate, rebel, dictator, perhaps even a god, as well as a husband, father, lover, and adulterer. Uh, Was he a good dude? I don't know. So hard to judge the morality of someone who lived so long ago. Hard not to fall into the trappings of presentism and try and impose the paradigm of modern morality onto this person who lived so long ago, even though it doesn't make any sense to do so. Uh, He certainly was a dude who lived one hell of a memorable life. One of the most memorable lives of all, perhaps. Uh, Did he do what he did for the glory of Rome? Maybe in his mind, uh, but I don't think entirely. Uh, Seems to have, uh, you know, been based on a lot of ego and ambition. You know what he did? Probably did most of what he did for the glory of Caesar. Uh, Caesar was born during the Roman Republic, but he was born into a republic full of corruption, violent political rivalries, and a class hierarchy that mostly benefited the wealthy. So why the fuck would he want to be a part of that mess as a young man? Well, as the Britannic Online Encyclopedia writes, uh, the requirements and the cost of a Roman political career in Caesar's day were high and the competition was severe, but the potential profits were of enormous magnitude, right? Money. That's why I wanted to get into this money, money and power. And yeah, but a a lot of money. I can hear some of the uh, Pink Floyd lyrics right now, right? Money, it's a gas. Grab that cash with both hands, make a stash. I mean, you know, Roger Waters sings it better, but there was a lot of money in Rome to be made in politics, like the most. If you rose above the heap, you became, uh, if you could become governor of a province, uh, you know, which you'd, uh, you'd also be like a, a general oftentimes, you could get all kinds of tributes from those you conquered. You could collect all kinds of spoils of war. In Caesar's time, Roman nobles distinguished themselves and their families by winning elections to higher and higher public offices, uh, culminating in consul. It was very difficult to get elected all the way to the top unless you had a lot of family wealth and influence. The classic, it takes money to make money. Noble families active in politics tended to have a lot of wealthy clients. So you had to be good at uh, getting some wealthy friends if you wanted to climb that ladder uh, who would give you political support. Ancient equivalent of today's lobbyists. uh, Grease and palms, scratch and backs. Lobbyists, maybe, and campaign contributors. These clients could be private individuals, foreign leaders, even entire countries. One of the special privileges that came with being elected a consul or a praetor was governing a province. I'll explain these positions here real soon. And again, governing a, governing a province, that really allowed you to build a lot of wealth, right? Just plunder the fuck out of it. Uh, according to Britannica, the whole Mediterranean world was, in fact, at the mercy of the Roman nobility and of a new class of Roman businessmen. The... Uh, Equities, kind of knights, which had grown rich on military contracts and on tax farming. And you could replace equities with uh, governors. Uh, Peasants supplied military manpower during Caesar's day, which was new. Rome was changing drastically. Earlier in the Republic, all Roman men of a certain age who could afford to supply their own weapons and other equipment who could pay for their own, uh, you know, battles, essentially, they would fight for Rome when called upon. They would have to fight for Rome when called upon or suffer consequences. Landowners and nobles did a lot of the fighting. And they had something to fight for, building their wealth throughout uh, conquests and uh, spoils of war and also not losing the shit they already had to enemies. But then thanks to the uh, Marian reforms implemented just seven years before Caesar's birth, a new standing army was created. And this is what I alluded to earlier about how this uh, military reform is going to change everything. Now, not just people of uh, means would fight when needed. And actually, they would kind of stop fighting. It would be the peasant class. Rome's many territorial expansions in recent years and an increasing number of adversaries, thanks primarily to those expansions, necessitated now larger armies. And the old ways of recruiting were just no longer sufficient. More bodies were needed, a lot more. They had way too many provinces to govern, too many enemies at the gate. So now being a soldier became a career option. And soldiers were generally conscripted from the poor classes for the first time. And this reform also granted citizenship and land to Roman soldiers. So if you were poor, landless, if you weren't a Roman citizen, go become a soldier, right? It could change your life for the better drastically. Go get those spoils of war. Change the course of your family's history. The reform also put the responsibility of supplying and managing an army in the hands of generals. The state would pay for, you know, a lot of the supplies, but the general would administer the army. And now these generals could build a lot of wealth and loyalty. 
a lot of wealth through spoils of war, you know, but, but a lot of loyalty through getting their soldiers spoils of war. Enough sometimes to no longer need funding from Rome and be able just to kind of go rogue. These generals, men, uh, you know, to become a general, you didn't have to level up through a bunch of military training. You just had to have the right political and financial backing. Uh, these men wanted to go conquer new land so they could have it, so they could build their own, you know, wealth and fortunes, you know, all around the Mediterranean. And a good general gave them both land and wealth for the trouble of risking their lives and killing enemies of Rome. The positive for this reform was much bigger armies for Rome, you know, who were much more incentivized to go kick as much ass as possible, expand as far as possible. Much more professional armies were now always ready to fight, which aided empire expansion greatly. The negative was now the military was a lot harder to control. Now, if you commanded a powerful enough army, you could take over the Republic. And that's what, of course, happened with Caesar. And also, and I didn't know this, happened before Caesar. Caesar would see this happen, what he was going to do when he was in his late teens, a version of it. Uh, and Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix, aka normally called just Sulla, a Roman general and statesman, won the first large-scale civil war in Roman history and became the first man of the Republic to seize power through force, becoming a dictator for a few years before voluntarily stepping down to go live a quieter life. So yeah, Caesar was not the first dictator to take over the Roman Republic uh, through like violent means. Sulla was. Uh, the Roman Republic, one of the earliest examples of representative democracy in the world, again, was in trouble when Caesar was growing up and Sulla proved that. People now wondered who would be the next Sulla? Would Rome return to being uh, ruled as it was in its first few centuries before the Republic, you know, by a king or a king equivalent? Could democracy last? As written again in Britannica, it was fairly clear that the most probable alternative was some form of military dictatorship backed by dispossessed Italian peasants who would turn to long-term military service. The traditional competition among members of the Roman nobility for office and the spoils of office was thus threatening to turn into a desperate race for seizing autocratic power. And one of the men racing to seize that autocratic power would, of course, be Julius Caesar. I think that's how you speak, uh, you know, Roman names, right? Like if you're doing a Roman production, I am Julius Caesar at your service. Well, he wouldn't say at your service. Uh, Caesar was a man who uh, came from a noble family, but not a particularly influential or powerful one at the time of his birth. Uh, Caesar's father died when he was just 15 years old. Some sources say 16. And the um, ambitious young man was thrown headfirst into, a, yeah, as I said a few times, very violent, chaotic political world. Young Caesar was determined to make something of himself and hot damn, would he do that? Caesar left such a lasting impact on ancient Rome, he was deified. After his assassination. You know what? I want that too. Nothing, nothing crazy. I just want like a little deification. Just let me become like a minor god. Just like a little god you can worship uh, with like a little statue you can put in your garden or, or bathroom or something. Just uh, Danicus, god of weird knowledge. You, you can pay tribute by just putting down some trivial pursuit cards or stuff like that in front of the statue. Maybe like a donut or something. Just a little statue of a, of a big headed bearded dude. With uh, some decent muscles, but also a sizable waistline. Just a Buddha-like figure with a higher hairline. Let it be so. Okay, now before we examine his life and learn a lot more about the Republic and the timeline, uh, let us learn the basics about the type of government that he became immersed in and learned to skillfully navigate before, uh, you know, leading an army against Rome to take it over and change everything. Uh, stress on the basics of this government right here. To thoroughly explain this would take hours and hours and eventually... Even I would fall asleep because I start to find the minutiae of all this uh, pretty fucking boring after a while. But I, but I like the synopsis. Uh, to begin to understand how Rome's government worked, who got to participate in this representative democracy? Like who got to vote? Citizens. Hail Nimrod. Male citizens. Sorry, Lucifina. Uh, freeborn women in ancient Rome were citizens, but could not vote or hold political office. They were like citizen light. Uh, because of their limited public role, women uh, also named less frequently than men by Roman historians. So sorry, ladies. The social structure of ancient Rome was based on heredity, property, wealth, citizenship, and freedom. There were three broad classes of society in Rome. Uh, Roman citizens, non-Roman citizens, and then slaves. Each group having more rights than the one beneath it. And there were subclasses like uh, patricians, uh, plebeians. So who were Roman citizens? Well, initially, when the Roman Republic first got going centuries before Caesar's birth, citizenship was granted only to those freeborn over the age of 18, listed as over the age of 15 in some sources, living in or like just outside of the actual city of Rome. Uh, I'll probably repeat a lot of this going forward 
or this a lot, excuse me, going forward, but the details change about the Roman government from source to source quite a bit because Rome was around for so long and the laws were always changing as it kept going, you know, uh, based on who was in power during the Republic, new people were in positions of power, like every year, literally a lot of turnover in the top positions. Everyone wanted to make their mark on the government, create their own legacy. So they had to change what the previous person did, yada, yada, yada. Uh, as Rome became more powerful and gradually expanded, you know, so did citizenship, what that meant. Uh, and, and, you know, and who got to be a citizen. More and more new people uh, were becoming part of Rome as more territory was being conquered leading up to Caesar and during his life. You know, uh, you know, previously a lot of these people excluded from basic voting rights, property rights, and they were getting fucking pissed and rebelling. They were burdened with taxation and military conscription, but not given many privileges. You know, you don't give someone enough to lose. And of course, they're going to come after your shit. Uh, some between, uh, so between 70 BCE, a few decades before Caesar's death and 28 BCE, roughly 3 million new people were added to the Roman citizenry register. Thanks to opening up the possibility of who could be a citizen. The times were changing by 89 BCE. When Caesar was around uh, 11, all freeborn members of the Italian peninsula below the river Po, I'm um, just making sure I said this previously thing, right? Okay. Did, uh, had been granted full citizenship. Prior to that, they'd gradually begun to enjoy most rights of Roman citizenship except the right to vote and hold various political offices. To include people of other territories within the borders of Romans, uh, Rome's empire to give them citizenship was to give conquered peoples a reason to be loyal to Rome. Much more reason. Rights of citizenship included the right to vote, the right to hold political office, uh, hold legal property as a Roman citizen, which helped keep you from losing your property. Uh, you could also now have a legal Roman marriage contract or immune from certain taxes. You had a right to sue in the court system, have a legal trial, appeal a judge's ruling, the right not to be tortured. Uh, prior to the expansion of Roman citizenship, even if you lived in Roman territory and paid Roman taxes, a lot of taxes, if you weren't a citizen, well, some Roman could theoretically take your shit, uh, take your wife since she wasn't really your wife, since you didn't have a Roman marriage certificate, torture you, kill you, possibly face no punishment. You had nowhere near the rights of a Roman. You were a, you were a conquered savage, a subhuman uh, thing in, in some ways, not as lowly as a slave, but not nearly as important as a Roman citizen. So how did one prove Roman citizenship once you, once you had it, uh, through pushups, you had to knock out a hundred in a minute, solid form, touch your chest to the ground, or you could fuck off and die. No, uh, the Romans had birth certificates, grants of citizenships, military diplomatas they had various official documents they could carry around that would prove that they were someone not to be fucked with. And of course, the requirements to be a citizen, what rights it carried again, changed throughout the years, you know, throughout Caesar's life, even citizenship in ancient Rome was complex based upon many different laws, traditions, and cultural practices. There existed several types of citizenship determined by one's gender, class, political affiliation, uh, exact duties or expectations of a citizen would vary throughout the history of the Roman empire and from place to place within it at points with citizenship also came responsibilities. For example, Roman, uh, for example, Roman citizens were expected to perform some duties to the state in order to retain their rights as citizens. Failure to perform citizenship duties could result in the loss of privileges as seen during the Second Punic War against the Cartha, Cartha, oh my gosh, Carthaginians, there we go, uh, when men who refused military service lost their right to vote. Uh, by Caesar's time, though, being a male citizen no longer meant you, you had to fight. You didn't have to worry about that anymore. You could be a businessman, politician, Sandal polisher, toga stain remover, little Caesar's pizza franchise owner. I don't know, whatever. Basic citizenship uh, overview complete. Now I want to go over some summarized definitions for five terms, within which there will be more terms. Terms key to beginning uh, to understand the Roman Republic. Patricians, uh, plebeians, or plebs, sometimes pronounced plebs. Uh, praetors, sometimes pronounced praetors, consuls, and censors. I think that's five. <laughs> now I'm questioning myself. All right, Patricians one, Plebeians two, uh, Praetors three, Cons. Okay, yeah, all right, I counted right. Good for me. Uh, the Patricians were the group of ruling class families in ancient Rome. Think British aristocrats and nobles. Uh, and then uh, later towards the end of the Republic, super successful businessmen and landowners. Well, you had to initially be born into this class. Uh, the term Patrician lost more and more meaning as, and distinction as time went on. Shortly before the Republic fell by Julius Caesar's time, there were so few patricians left that a special law was made for the enrollment of new patricians. They had a, a fucking noble shortage. The patrician families had dominated Rome for centuries by the time of Caesar. They did still have quite a bit of power and prestige when he began to ascend towards his takeover, but, you know, dwindling. Things were unraveling, getting muddy. 
The empire had expanded so much, so quickly, too fast. There have been so many intermarriages, new laws, more favorable to the working class of Romans passed over the centuries. Uh, As American science fiction author Philip K. Dick once wrote, no structure, even an artificial one, enjoys the process of entropy. It is the ultimate fate of everything, and everything resists it. Entropy, a gradual decline into disorder. Many think the natural fate for everything. Right, The second law of thermodynamics, a closed system energy flows from order to disorder. And over time with Rome, as with every other great empire from years past, eventually disorder prevailed, right? And they crumbled. By the time of Caesar, Rome, as a republic, was crumbling, was heading into disorder, further and further into disorder. And they would later return to a state of order within the Roman Empire. And then entropy would do its thing all over again, and the empire would now crumble. Rising and falling, coming together, unraveling the natural order of the world until eventually everything totally unravels. Can we ever defeat entropy? I skimmed some cool science article on inverse.com titled to beat death and become immortals. We first must defeat entropy. And then subtitled, if we hope to tackle immortality, we'll need to start from scratch and investigate whether it's even thermodynamically possible. Fascinating, right? I know it's a very tangential thought, but I wanted to share it. Uh, Back to the word patrician now. In full disclosure, I wanted to mention entropy also so I could reference Philip K. Dick. I had to make sure that I got at least some dick in this suck. After last week's dick drought. <laughs> yeah! Uh, back, to, back to some dick. Uh, the word patrician comes from the Latin patris, meaning fathers, and these daddies and their families provided the empire's political, religious, and military leadership. I think we should call the patricians daddies quite a bit going forward, don't you? Fucking daddies were running Rome. <laughs> Had been running Rome for too long, and a lot of the kids were sick of these daddies. They were sick of having, listen, all these daddy rules. Uh, Most initial daddy patricians were wealthy landowners from old families, but the class over time became open to a few who had been deliberately promoted by the emperor, and then it would be uh, opened up a little more than that even. According to Livy, Roman historian alive at the time of Christ, so not that long after Caesar, the first 100 men appointed as senators by Romulus, founder of Rome, back in the 8th century BCE were referred to again as fathers or daddies, and the descendants of these hunky father daddies became the patrician class. Did you have any idea that you were going to get so much hot, hunky, father-daddy action in this suck? So much daddies today. The daddies are your dreams. Call 1-900-HOT-DADDY to talk to real, nude, rock-hard father-daddies today. Sorry, that had fucking nothing to do with Rome. You knew that. I was just hoping that at this point in the episode that you might uh, felt safe. Maybe safe enough to blast us on your speaker at work. And then your fucking boss walks right in the room, right as I start saying stuff like hot daddy on daddy action, wet daddies, hard daddies, rippled father daddies covered in olive oil, maybe your own juices, glistening in the sun. Call one night hundred daddy juice for all that Roman daddy action. <laughs> Mama mia, that's a spice of meatball. Uh, I think I know that now. But it's very fun for me to do for some reason. Anyway, this, or, <laughs> this origin tale about the daddies is also included in an account by Cicero, contemporary of Caesar. The appointment of these uh, 100 daddies into the Senate <laughs> gave them a noble status. And then their descendants, you know, kept increasing those daddy ranks. Uh, a couple more quick things. Members of the Senate generally serve for life unless some kind of criminal action or serious scandal, you know, got them tossed. Like if you uh, killed 100 Roman children or the public found out that at one time in another country 12 years back, you drove a chariot around drunk. You know, something evil and unforgivable like that. So that they might keep you out of Canada. (laughs) So that they would prove that you're a dirtbag of the lowest order. Come on. Maybe I am going to explain my, uh, why I can't go to Vancouver. I'll I'll give more details in another suck. Back to Senate facts. Generally, there were between 300 and 500 senators. By the time Caesar took over Rome, there were around 600. And then he added about 300 more. Many of the new faces were equestrians. Uh, people coming from random Italian towns, not called Rome. Some even came from Gaul. Ugh. Equestrians or equities ranked right below senators. Uh, the equestrian class as their name, as far as like nobles, as their name suggests, were originally composed of the Roman cavalry and then their rights and powers morphed over time. Think of them as the uh, second most powerful class of property owners right behind all those hot land owning father daddies. Uh, Roman equities were also compared a lot to medieval knights by historian or have been. In early Rome, the equities were drawn from the senatorial class. 
From the beginning of the 4th century BCE, non-senators would become enlisted in the cavalry. By the 1st century BCE, foreign cavalry uh, tended to replace them in the field and thus restrict the equestrian order to posts as officers or members of the general staff. By this time, the equities had become a, a class distinct from the senators. Unlike senators, they were legally free to enter the fields of commerce and finance. Uh, known as publicani, those who were businessmen enriched themselves by securing contracts to supply the army and to collect taxes and by exploiting public lands, mines, quarries, and provinces and such. They, they ended up kind of becoming like uh, Rome's IRS agents. IRS agents who exploited the fuck out of the provinces. A lot of Rome's wealth came from exploiting the provinces. Say Rome decided to uh, build some lavish building and they needed 5 billion uh, sestaris or uh, sesters. Oh my God. Sesterses. Fucking whatever. Uh, <laughs> they will charge the uh, publicani to go collect it from who, you know whatever province. And then the publicani will then hand that money over to the Senate. But then, uh, you know, maybe they collect a little extra. Maybe they collect 6 billion or 7 billion. And then they just keep the change and they make a lot of money. In this way, the equities became a very prosperous business and landowning class, eventually forming one of the Republic's top three political groups in a growing power struggle in Rome. On to the second big term now, plebeian, the plebs or the plebes. A lot of people say plebs. I, I like plebs. Uh, plebes were members of the general body of free Roman citizens who were part of the lower strata of society, the working class. And again, since the Roman Republic lasted for almost 500 years, from 509 BCE to 27 BC. Things tw- changed quite a bit over time for them. By the last stages of the Republic during Caesar's time, the plebes had gained a lot of power and rights compared to where they started. They could hold various political offices, such as tribune. A tribune could veto any action of the magistrates, senate, or other assemblies. A little balance on the power of the senate. And the tribunes were elected by plebeian councils. Uh, the plebeian council, the principal assembly of the common people of the ancient Roman Republic. This council, I said plural earlier, one, functioned as a legislative slash judicial assembly through which the plebeians could pass legislation, elect plebeian tribunes, uh, try judicial cases, elect plebeian uh, ediles, magistrates who are responsible for maintenance of public buildings and regulation of public festivals and more. And the power to enforce public order and duties to ensure the city of Rome was well supplied at civil infrastructure, well maintained akin to a modern local government. A lot of politicians, so much fucking government in the Republic. So much, like so much red tape. It was insane by Caesar's time. Uh, Now for the praetors. The praetor, a term used to describe people who had all kinds of official duties, changed a lot over the life of Rome. In Caesar's day, a praetor was a judicial officer who had broad authority in cases of equity. The praetor was also responsible for the public games and exercised authority in the government in the absence of consuls. After a year, the praetors uh, usually became provincial governors. And then two more. First, the censor. Roman censors by Caesar's time served for only 18 months, but were incredibly powerful. Two censors would serve at one time and they had to agree on decisions and they, you know, they could veto each other's decisions. Uh, the power of the censor was nearly absolute. No magistrate could oppose their decisions except I assume consuls, it's a little murky in sources, and only another censor who succeeded a censor could cancel their decisions. Uh, to be a censor, generally, uh, there were some exceptions. You had to have previously been a consul. It's also fucking complicated. The censor's regulation of public morality is the uh, origin of the modern meaning of the word censor and censorship. The responsibility of keeping the public morals pretty complex and widely encompassing. And I'm sure confusing as fuck for many Romans. Guessing many censors uh, abuse the fuck out of this power to harass political opponents and the like. Basically, with this morality thing, they were charged with making sure Romans upheld changing Roman values to keep the character of Rome alive. Or else. Like, they could decide, for example, if you behaved improperly towards your wife or kids. Or if you were too disobedient towards your parents. Uh, They could decide uh, uh, if you were too cruel to your slaves, uh, if you were too lazy in keeping your fields cultivated, and then you could be punished in a variety of manners. Like you you could lose titles, land, your life. Uh, Also in charge of the census or register of the citizens and of their property, which was very important for tax collecting purposes. You got to know who you can uh, collect tax from, who owes what to Rome. And they determined who qualified for equestrian rank for a time. Also were in charge of the administration of the finances of the state under which uh, were classed the superintendents of public buildings and the erection of new public works. Finally, consuls. And there's going to be overlap on some of these too, uh, which is weird. Consuls like censors, very powerful, maybe more so, before Caesar just uh, took shit over, before the emperors that would follow the fall of the Roman Republic, uh, the Roman Empire, uh, consuls ruled Rome, the real heads of state. 
But since they only ruled for one year terms, uh, you know, they didn't take shit too far because they didn't want to be fucked with by senators after their term was up. So there was a lot of incentive for them to play nice and not abuse that power. And they also worked in pairs, had to agree, could veto each other. They commanded the army, uh, convened and presided over the Senate and the popular assemblies and executed their decrees and represented the state in foreign affairs. When their terms expired, consuls generally appointed to serve as governors of provinces and make a lot of money. And governors, by the way, were chosen, uh, as I said, yeah, I said also could be chosen from preachers, as I said earlier. Okay, I'm about done now. I hope I didn't fuck any of that up. <laughs> Last thing I, sh- I guess I should summarize is just the Senate itself. That legislative body, you know, full of so many hot, hard, patrician father daddies just covered in olive oil. Uh, according to the Greek historian, uh, pl- pl- oh my gosh, Polybius, there we go, Polybius. Uh, who lived in the second century BCE, the principal source on the constitution of the Roman Republic, a set of uncodified and constantly evolving norms and customs, which together with various written laws that also constantly evolved, guided the procedural governance of the Rome, uh, Roman Senate, of Rome, excuse me. The Roman Senate was the predominant branch of government. Polybius noted that in practice, it was the consuls who led the armies and the civil government in Rome. And it was the Roman assemblies, which had the ultimate authority over elections, legislation, and criminal trials. However, since the Senate controlled money, administration, and the details of foreign policy, it had the most control over day-to-day life. So, yeah, holy shit. The Roman uh, government during the Republic had a very complex, very convoluted system of government, right? Leave it to politicians to overcomplicate the fuck out of everything. Everybody wants to have their say. Uh, No wonder this shit eventually collapsed in on the massive weight of itself. As the Republic went on, right, its giant system of government just kept getting bigger and more convoluted and more complicated as uh, more citizens, you know, uh, were incorporated into Rome. I'm not surprised emperors eventually took it over. Just fuck all this shit. I'm not going to try and pass this law through 37 different groups and get it signed by another 46 different positions. It's a law because I said it's a fucking law. Uh, Caesar would try and in his way simplify a lot of this by, you know, taking shit over. You know, just fuck all this. Uh, you know, these pairs of these guys for one year at a time and then those pairs of those guys for 18 months at a time and then this guy's more powerful than that guy, but not really. And then these guys have to be born into these positions or they're used to, but not really anymore. And then this body keeps check on that body, which also keeps check back on the first body. And then there's like a third body that kind of keeps check on both of them, but who cares? Because now generals are doing what they want to do fucking anyway. Caesar would eventually just think, how about I just run shit, you know, like forever, uh, you know? For life. And that freaked a lot of people out because the Roman Republic was founded to move away from one dude being in charge, you know, being led by a king like it was for two and a half centuries before the Republic. (sighs) Okay. Hard part over, I think. Now that we hopefully know a bit more about Rome, let's jump into a timeline of Julius Caesar's life, a political and military career, and complicated web of alliances in today's historical time suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Gaius Julius Caesar was born on July 12th or July 13th, 100 BCE in Rome, Italy. Roman men generally had three names like English speakers, but not with the same meaning attached to each one. A lot of our middle names don't mean anything other than, uh, you know, somebody thought it sounded cool around the time we were born. Uh, Your first name was your informal name picked by your parents. So for Caesar, uh, Gaius was his equivalent roughly of of my name of Dan, right? Your middle name was actually a hereditary name. The name of your gens, which was your family or clan. More like our last name now. The Roman last name was was kind of a a second last name. It identified which branch of a family you belong to, right? To be like, (laughs) I'm trying to compare it to mine now just on the fly. You know, it's like, it was like Dan Cummins and then I don't even know what the fucking qualifier. I was going to say something, but I felt like I'd be being shitty to my family. No, but uh, yeah, yeah, identify which branch. It modified the middle clan identifier name. So like Gaius was part of the Caesar branch of Gens Julia. Uh, Caesaris is actually the name of the family within a patrician, hot father, daddy Gens. So for women, the middle name was the only name used in Caesar's day. For example, three member, uh, three members of Gens Julia, one of the most prominent patrician families in ancient Rome, our Caesar was born into, right? Were uh, uh, Gaius Julius Caesar and then his sisters, Julia Major and Julia Minor, as in Julia the Elder 
and Julia the Younger. And that shows what they thought of women at the time. Man, damn, dudes, dudes get three names. Women basically get one and sometimes have to share it. Right? Old Julia and young Julia. Might as well have named uh, them old woman and young woman. Womb number one, womb number two. So interesting little uh, notes about their names. Cool trivia, the month in which Caesar was born uh, was renamed July to honor him. Julius, Latin name for July. Uh, the Western world has leaned on the the calendar that came uh, out of, uh, you know, w- when Caesar changed things and had his name implemented into it uh, for over 2,000 years now. He's had a whole month named after him. Can you imagine having a month named after you? Like when Caesar was changed to honor him after his death, it uh, would have been even cooler. He did change the calendar when he was alive and then that month changed to honor him uh, for doing so and other things after death. So much cooler if he would have uh, had a change when he was alive, Right. When was I born? Why, during the month of Daniel, of course. It tis I, Daniel, God of a man who is also a marker of time. I wish Julius would have had a funnier name though for a month, right? Like Derek. That'd be pretty entertaining. I don't know, maybe we'd be used to it, but it sounds entertaining now. Like how many months is our vacation? Hmm, let me see. March, April, May, June, Derek, August. <laughs> Six months. <laughs> That'd be so fun. Uh, six months ago. Uh, the Caesarean section procedure, also named after Caesar, but probably due to someone being mistaken about him receiving it. Even though the procedure was actually used back when he was alive in Rome, there is no evidence. And it's very unlikely that Caesar was actually born by C-section. During Roman times and for several hundred years thereafter, a Caesarean section uh, was not something the mother was expected to survive. It seems Julius likely received, as they do say in the medical community, a natural birth, or as my doctor calls it, a, a push inject, a push, puss ejection <laughs> sorry i ruined that most babies are ejected out of a puss or vagina sometimes it's also called again according to my doctor a front butt dump that's another acceptable <laughs> medical term were you a c-section baby no i was a front butt dump thank you uh the more you know uh, in caesar's day c-sections were only performed to save the baby when the pregnant person was dying or you know sadly already dead Caesar's mother would live until 54 BCE, so her vagina was probably super solid and very capable of a strong front butt dump. Uh, But enough about Caesar's mom's lady garden. Let's talk about his family in broader terms before meeting his dad and the rest of his, uh, uh, and maybe a little bit more about his mom. Uh, Caesar's family, member of Gens Julia, were known as the Julii. They were patricians, but not nearly as wealthy as many others in Rome during his, you know, early life. Caesar would claim to be a descendant of the goddess Venus. That seems pretty fucking weird but totally normal for Roman nobility back then. They were always trying to make their families seem more powerful, more prestigious, more godlike uh, by actually claiming direct lineage from various gods. I wish people, that might be pretty funny if people still did still, ah, my God, getting tongue-tied, uh, still did that. I mean, some people still do that, do that but uh, only people who are severely, you know, mentally ill or, you know, crazy-ass cult leaders or wackadoodle scammers or something. I want modern nobility and the rich and powerful to do that. You know, for King Charles to talk about how he's, I don't know, directly descended from Thor or something. Or if uh, Jeff Bezos, you know, started bragging about being the son of Apollo, helps him with shipping. Kendall Jenner, trying to get you to buy more of her skincare because she's Venus's niece. You know what? Actually, let's not do that because too many people would believe it. <laughs> There'd be a lot of comments online. Like, oh, that's so cool. I wish I was Venus's niece. Uh, despite Caesar's claims of having the blood of gods running through his veins, Caesar's family, not very wealthy, not very influential, as I mentioned. Maybe they only had a few drops of Venus's blood, needed a transfusion or something. So does the name Caesar come from the gods? No. Uh, some sources claim the name Caesar comes from one of his ancestors who was cut, or uh, casus in Latin, from his mother's womb. While uh, he was a front butt dump, at least one of his hot daddy ancestors uh, may have been a C-section. AKA, if you want to get into, again, proper medical terminology, a MFU, a motherfucker upper. Uh, glad, I have a, glad I have a chance to really kind of, uh, you know, flex uh, my uh, in-depth knowledge of current medical terms in this episode. Other theories on the origin of his name state that the founding member of the Caesar family had long hair called Caesaris. And I don't like that. That doesn't make Caesar feel as cool as it should for a name now associated with so much power. Right now, the name Caesar... Uh, you know, that, that's, it's the root of Kaiser in German, czar in the Slavic languages. Caesar became synonymous with emperor in the Roman empire. But at one time it just meant, uh, long hair. Funny how times change. His name sounds so fucking cool today, but back when he was a young dude, you know, it might've been on par with perm or mullet. Now I wish his name would have been Derek because he could, he could have been like Derek mullet. 
That's a good Roman name. Derek Mullet. And then the, like the, the clan name is Skeet Skeet. Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. Uh, Hog Photicus. Dog Photicus. You get it. Uh, Caesar's father was also named Gaius Julius Caesar. So he was kind of a junior, but that's not how it worked back then. Uh, Gaius Caesar, his dad, his daddy father was an important regional governor in Asia whose brother Sextus Julius Caesar was a consul in 91 BCE. So while he wasn't born in the most powerful family, he definitely wasn't uh, born into poverty. His story wasn't exactly rags to riches. Uh, Caesar's mother, Caesar's? Caesar's mother was Aurelia. uh, And she doesn't really get a last name because vagina. Uh, Very little is written about her. The historian Tacitus considered her an ideal Roman matron, thought highly of her because she offered her children the best opportunities of education. Uh, the Roman historian Plutarch described her as a woman of discretion. And that's sadly about all we know. Uh, Caesar had, had those two sisters. Again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Julia Major and Julia Minor. Old woman, young woman. Baby maker one, baby maker two. Uh, Julia Minor, young woman, would also go on to become the maternal grandmother of Augustus, the future first emperor of Rome. The month of August was named, uh, kind of like by adopting. It's a little complicated, but uh, the month of August was named after uh Oh my gosh, uh, after Augustus, first uh, emperor of Rome. And how crazy is that to have two of the 12 months be named for members of the same family for over 2,000 years and counting? Pretty disappointed in my family right now to not, not even have one month. Uh, Caesar came from a family involved in politics in addition to his uncle being a consul, a distant cousin, Lucius Caesar, also a consul in 90 BCE. And Caesar was the nephew of General Gaius Marius, the guy who shifted the uh, way Roman armies were formed in a way that would lead to the end of the Republic and the beginning of an empire. Uh, Caesar's family, political alliances, very important in Rome, sided with the Papa, oh my gosh, here we go, Popolares. A Popolares is a, like a spaghetti Maserati, uh, Antonio Banderas. Uh. No, it's um, Latin for supporters of the people who favored a more democratic government and increased rights of the lower class. So let's see, Popolares. <laughs> I don't know why I'm suddenly saying that one at time. The other most popular political group was the uh, Optimates. Optimates. Optimates, Latin for the best ones. The best ones. Kind of sounds like a a Letus Dix when you translate it that way. Uh, There's a lot of academic debate over whether the Optimates and the Popolares were political parties in conflict with one another or just different political ideologies, which people shifted either towards or away from, right? Kind of like how the terms liberal and conservative can work. They can be associated with the Democratic or Republican parties, or they can just be a, a general way of looking at the world and not mean you're associated with any party. And you can lean, you know, more towards one on one issue, more towards another on a different issue and have a mix of ideologies. You know, maybe when it comes to gladiator matches, you're more of a, a popolares. Uh, but when it comes to uh, what those fucking sneaky ass galls are up to, you're more of an uh, optimates. Uh, Caesar lived in Sabura as a young man, a neighborhood not far from the Colosseum. Some sources say this was Rome's red light district during Caesar's time. Oh, my. Uh, so crazy that he lived so long ago, but also in such a massive urban city, a, v- a very modern city in so many ways, you know, over 2000 years ago, he had more amenities in so many ways than we had here in Idaho for anyone like 150 years ago. That's so weird for me to think about. Historians have been able to piece together actually a, a pretty clear picture of what the daily life of an ancient Roman was like. I think this little window is, uh, is, is pretty cool. So let's uh, take a little detour to learn a bit about the city Caesar grew up in and what, you know, uh, the one he would take over, what life was like there. In his 1936 book, Daily Life in Ancient Rome, historian Jerome uh, Carcopino describes the routines that define the existence of city dwellers during the first century CE. So after the time of Caesar, for sure, but not that long afterwards for back then. You know, things wouldn't be that different. Things weren't progressing over 50 or so years like they have in the last 50 or so years uh, for us. Not at all. Modern tech has changed life so much, right? It it moves so much faster. It evolves so much faster uh, than it ever did before. Anyway, according to Carcopino, the citizens of ancient Rome started their day before sunrise. Some because they had to go to work that early. Others because of the noise of other people moving about on the streets around them. This big crowded city prevented them from getting any more sleep, right? Because they didn't have apps on their phones. It kicked out ambient or ambient white noise back then. Didn't have large kind of noisy air conditioners or stereos or anything. There were so many people moving around heading to work in the mornings that they uh, actually had a traffic problem in Rome. Ancient Rome's rapid expansion and frequent fires turned the city map into a mess of tangling streets, side roads that became super crowded. To help ease traffic congestion, as decreed by Caesar, one of the many things he did, only carts were allowed on the streets uh, uh, of building contractors. 
at certain times a day. For most Romans, after their work was done, working at your, uh, you know, your your little uh, spice or, or bookshop or whatever, um, restaurant, tavern, etc. I was going to say like spice store. I don't know why I didn't add store. When you worked at your spice, you would go, you get up early in the morning, you go to your spice. Where do you work? At my spice. Uh, no, you go to your spice shop, bookshop, restaurant, tavern, whatever. Then the entire afternoon was likely reserved for recreation. So that sounds fucking awesome. Uh, ancient Rome had a lively leisure industry, meaning citizens could entertain themselves in a number of ways on their afternoons off. They might see a play at the theater, watch races at the Circus Maximus. Of course, there was the Colosseum. I mean, you know, if you worked at those places, you didn't get the afternoon off, so that that sucks. So someone, someone's always got to work. Uh, the Colosseum put on all kinds of shows, aside from the infamous gladiatorial matches. Spectators could witness skilled hunters take down exotic animals imported from all uh, corners of the empire. Or on rare occasions, the Colosseum floor would be flooded, filled with mock uh, shipwrecks. So fighters could restage historic naval battles. That is fucking wild. I knew about that, but it still blows my mind. Hungry onlookers could purchase various snacks from concession stands, ranging from almonds and uh, quinces to plums and pomegranates. On days when no spectacles or shows were provided, uh, continues Carcopino, the uh, Roman filled up the time until supper with strolling or gambling, exercise, or a bath at the public bathhouses. The city had been building these bathhouses since the 3rd century BCE, and by the 1st century CE, there were thousands of them just in Rome. Children entered the bathhouses free of charge, while adults paid almost nothing to watch the kids bathe. Watching kids bathe was, I guess, uh, a popular thing for Roman adults. Like, if they paid a little extra, uh, they could wash they could wash the kids, as long as they were patricians. And then these hot, hard daddies. Man, did they pay to scrub-a-dub those Roman kitties. Everyone had a great time. Mostly the hot, olive-oiled father daddies. And the kids got so clean, especially their butt cracks. Sorry, I wanted to make sure that there was a chance that some of you just, uh, you know, had a very uncomfortable moment again with someone overhearing you listen to this. I didn't get a lot of, a lot of sleep last night. I'm in a weird mood. Uh, no one was paying to watch the kids, as far as I'm aware of. Many Romans were fucking weird with kids. But we're not going to get into that shit today. Too much other stuff to explain. Uh, for real, the bathhouses sounded pretty sick. The primary feature, feature of these bathhouses was uh, every type of bath that ingenuity could devise. They had hot baths, cold baths, hot air baths, whatever the fuck that is, swimming pools. Most baths also uh, included, uh, or bathhouses included, you know, enclosed gardens, promenades, spaces to exercise. These things were like luxury spas. Fresh water was carried into these places from the city's aqueducts. Uh, you know, heated via a complex of furnaces hidden within the walls or underneath the floors of the houses, these bathhouses, they had radiant heat with so many amenities. Romans often spent, you know, many hours at these places. I want to spend a bunch of hours in one of these places. The Romans practiced several sports as well, uh, including a type of tennis played with the palm of the hand instead of a racket, a game comparable to rugby, uh, the baths and sport courts and most other activities typically closed at sundown, uh, though most left before that so they could, uh, have time to eat. Dinner was a, a very important event for the day. Very important meal in a lot of Romans days, uh, especially for patrician daddies uh, and their daddy lady or man friends. Uh, supper could last anywhere between one and four hours. Banquets were held by the most wealthy elite and those would go on until midnight oftentimes, uh, sometimes into the early hours of the morning. And, you know, sometimes they uh, they also had orgies, which yeah, were probably pretty fun. Uh, if you're well off, supper was served in a dining room. In ancient Rome, dining rooms contained uh, not tables and chairs, but reclining couches. And these couches were arranged around square tables where the food would be laid out. And so the movies, you know, and TV shows have not made this part of Roman life up. Uh, many Romans really did eat while lying on their side. Uh, their weight supported on one arm while the other was used to consume food. This horizontal position at the time was believed to aid in digestion. And it was also kind of like a flex. It was, uh, you know, the uh, utmost expression of elite standing. I don't, I don't even sit to eat. So fucking cool. I just lay down. Probably have someone feed me. Uh, people had guests over for meals often, uh, show off their wealth and status, and just, you know, hang and have fun with friends. Maybe do some networking in this super political place. When they had guests over, the host was expected to provide knives and spoons. Those were used to prepare and serve the food, but not to eat it. Romans did eat primarily with their hands, uh, and because of that custom, food was typically served in bite-sized portions, but they didn't eat like animals. Romans would often wash their hands before and after eating, and preferably, if they were very elite, between courses as well. Uh, hosted meals typically consisted of no less than seven courses, hors d'oeuvres, three entrees, 
two roasts. And remember, this could go on for hours and hours. And then a dessert. Primary sources cited by uh, Carcopino mentioned dishes like poppy seeds and suckling pig stuffed with dates uh, and red mullet, a popular fish delicacy. Not kidding with the red mullet. Great excuse for me to mention that Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet ate that shit the fuck up. Whenever he was invited over for a banquet, that's how he got his badass Roman name. Hail Mullet. Hail Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. Uh, Romans drank various wines at these meals that included honey wine, wine blended with resin and pine pitch. The latter variety was diluted by pouring it into a mixing bowl through a funnel strainer. While the dinner sounded great heading home from these dinners, it sounded like it sucked. Night was apparently pretty dangerous in Rome. If you didn't have security, weren't in a big group full of uh, dudes who could fight, uh, you know, you had to really worry about getting mugged or murdered. In normal times, writes Carcopino, night fell over the city like the shadow of a great danger. Everyone fled to his home, shut himself in, and barricaded the entrance. Jesus Christ. The shops fell silent. Safety chains were drawn across behind the leaves of the doors. The shutters of the flats were closed. The pots of flowers withdrawn from the windows they had adorned. Wealthy Romans leaving a a banquet after dark would be escorted home by an entourage of armed slaves with torches and would just have to hope that they weren't attacked by Derek Skate Skate Mullet. Hey, noodle armor cuss and tiny dick and cuss, give me your fucking shiny coins. And shit, you fucking plebe dweebs. Don't you fucking make me take my footicus and kick it up your flat weak assicus. I don't know, that's, I guess that's how Derek Mullet talks. Uh, Derek Mullet talks. Uh, common folk would have to find their way back in the dark. There was no oil lamps outside to light the way. Most plebes left at the mercy of the city's watchmen while these guards patrolled the city from dusk till dawn. Uh, this is a little bit after Caesar, though. Not, not before. Uh, Rome was too vast to monitor it in its entirety. And Rome did have a sort of uh, ancient police force, police slash firefighters, the watchmen of the city. All this and so much more around 2,000 years ago. Man, 150 years ago, pretty sure Idaho didn't uh, have any bathhouses or much law enforcement or lavish seven course banquets. Maybe the occasional backwoods orgy, which doesn't sound as fun as a Roman orgy. Uh, scholars aren't even sure, by the way, if they really had orgies like Hollywood has depicted them in Rome, by the way. Uh, reconnecting with Caesar now. Caesar's father dies suddenly in 85 BCE, making the 15-year-old 16 in some sources, the new head of the family. His dad died while putting on his shoes one morning. Guessing he had a heart attack. He was around 55. And now his son, his hot son daddy, uh, is thrown into a very chaotic environment due to a civil war between his uncle Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla, the guy who would become Rome, uh, the Republic's first dictator. Well, the first dictator who would take it over by force. There was another guy, there was another guy or two. Uh, these fuckers vied for power for years. They had both distinguished themselves fighting in the Italian War, aka the Social War, fought between 91 to 88 BCE between Rome and several Italian allies, allies who wanted full Roman citizenship. By 87 BC, Rome won this war, but also citizenship was now extended to all of the peninsular Italians to prevent further problems. And now Sulla and Marius both wanted to command soldiers in a war against Mithridates of Pontus, a Hellenistic kingdom to the east that ruled nearly all of Asia Minor at its height in Caesar's lifetime. Much of Persia, part of today's Greece, and most of the coastline around the Black Sea. Mithridates was perhaps the most formidable opponent of the Roman Republic called the greatest ruler of the kingdom of Pontus. This motherfucker was serious about ruling. This guy, uh, he cultivated an immunity to poison by regularly ingesting sub-lethal doses of a variety of poisons, a practice now called Mithridatism is named after him. Uh, After his death, he became known as Mithridate the Great. And now Marius and Sulla both want to be in charge of kicking his fucking poison licking ass. Uh, Marius was a a populares and Sulla, a man who once, uh, you know, fought as lieutenant underneath his rule in the field as a general was uh, in optimates and their ideological clashing and rivalry will lead to a big civil war known as Sulla's civil war lasting from 83 to 81 BCE. But really more than that, because it spilled out on either side of those years with more political squabbling, uh, fighting in the provinces, purges of detractors, etc. Really condensing this section because both these guys could take up an hour each. Uh, Sulla was named consul and tasked with leading the army by the Senate against Mithridates. Mithridates. Sorry, I think I keep cutting off singularly. Uh, But then after Sulla left the city to take command of this army, a tribune passed a new law transferring the appointment now to Marius. Right? Sulla, no gonna, uh, no gonna like this. Uh, He gonna get his his spaghetti all worked up and his marinara size, I'm gonna shoot it out of his ear holes. (laughs) I don't know why I did that. By the time Sulla found out, He'd already been kicking the shit out of uh, Mithridates. He'd won several battles and pushed him out of Greece. Like he's doing great. 
but now he's stabbed in the back by a bunch of legal maneuvering back in Rome. Marius sends two tribunes to tell him to hand the army over to him, right? And uh, Sulla murders them. Kind of illegal. Uh, you know, since he's, uh, oh my gosh, sorry. I flipped their fucking name. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sulla, Sulla murders them. I messed up other notes for a second there. Um, okay. So kind of illegal since, uh, Marius does have, you know, support of the Republic. Marius also sends some high ranking commanders to relieve Sulla of his command. And those guys get killed as well. And now it's fucking on. And now instead of finishing Mithridates off, he hurriedly concludes peace talks with him and then marches his army back on Rome. Uh, interestingly, he was joined by Crassus and Pompey, Julius Caesar's two primary future allies. Uh, Marius was not prepared for this. Uh, two, yes, okay, Crassus, oh my God, so there's so many fucking names, it makes my head spin. Marius was not prepared for this. No Roman general had ever marched a Roman army on Rome before, right? He, he wasn't ready for a hot, hot, oiled uh, daddy, this powerful. He wasn't up for this level of daddy on daddy action. Uh, Sulla had gone rogue. Marius organized a force of gladiators to defend Rome, but there was uh, not enough of them. There were no match for Sulla's army. So Marius now flees all the way to Africa to avoid execution while Sulla takes over Rome. Sulla will rule Rome as a dictator for two years and then actually retire and go work on his memoir and hang out with like cute uh, uh, actresses and stuff and eat grapes and shit in the country. Seriously. Uh, and there's so much more to this story. Events drag on for years before Marius dies in 86 BCE at the age of around 70 after sneaking back into Rome when Sulla has to go fight some Greeks again. And it's a whole complicated mess. But right now, I need to refocus on Caesar. Caesar was on the side of Marius, his uncle. Uh, the historian Plutarch wrote that as a teenager, Caesar was politically active in opposing Lucius Cornelius Sulla. Right? So now Sulla is having supporters of Marius killed. Obviously, this is not good for Caesar. He had bet on the wrong horse. Caesar had been nominated as the uh, new high priest of Jupiter by Marius while Sulla was away, right? You know, fighting this first time. Now, sure, uh, not sure if uh, Caesar was actually religious, by the way, or just knew that working as a priest, which was not a full-time job, just ceremonial mostly, uh, would help endear him to people and get his name out. A priest at that time had to come from a patrician family, also married to, uh, and be also be married to another patrician. Caesar was engaged to a plebeian girl, but ended the engagement, perhaps to a woman he loved, to marry a patrician for his career so he could get this appointment. 84 BCE now, Caesar marries Cornelia, daughter of Lucius Cornelius Cinna, who was a consul, a uh, big time political marriage. He's already trying to climb the ladder. He's only around 16. Cinna was a four-time consul uh, from 87 to 84 BCE when he died. And Cinna also aligned with Marius, right? When Sulla becomes dictator in 82 BCE, he had a constituent, legislative, military, and judicial power without any limits on how long he could act as dictator, right? but he only ruled for two years, as I said. Uh, he actually was a good dictator, had a lot of detractors killed, but, you know, probably either that or have one of them come back and kill him. Caesar doesn't learn that lesson, as you'll find out later. Instead of doing whatever he could to uh, keep hold on his power, Sulla sets about reforming the constitution to reestablish the supremacy of the Senate in the Roman state in order to try and prevent further dictators, which I find interesting. Also increased the number of courts for criminal trials, required tribunes to uh, submit proposals to the Senate for approval, made laws to protect citizens against ex uh, excessive actions by the government. Uh, in 80 or 79 BC, Sulla resigns, right? Dictator out, moved to the coast near the current Italian city of Naples. Uh, most agree this was an honorable act because he had pledged to step down once his reforms were carried out and then dies in 78 BCE due to a fever. So backing up to late 82 BCE now, Sulla orders Caesar to divorce Cornelia after he wins that civil war. Caesar's family and Cornelius had been against him, so he's punishing them. Caesar refuses, and as a result, loses his property, uh, his priesthood, and is almost killed. Has a decree put out, uh, you know, to, uh, to be executed. Uh, he goes into hiding. He flees. Uh, he is captured by one of Sulla's men and is forced to pay a large bribe to not be killed. Caesar's mother's family now steps in and is barely able to have the execution order Sulla placed on him lifted. I'm sure they paid a lot of money to do that. Now Caesar decides to leave Italy and uh, do some military service in the province of Asia and Cilicia, the part of Turkey located in Asia. Caesar unable to support himself uh, or his wife if he doesn't join the military now. He had everything taken from him. He needs money. Uh, and he will also, when he goes over there, reportedly fight very well in Asia Minor. He will be awarded the civic crown for directly saving a Roman life during battle by killing an enemy about to take that life. Caesar will return to Rome in 78 BCE after Sulla dies. He didn't want to come back before, too worried that Sulla would change his mind and decide to execute him. 
And now the 22 year old really starts his political career. Uh, Caesar will hold so many political titles throughout his life. First, he becomes a prosecutor and becomes known for his oratory skills. Uh, like nearly every dictator I can think of, at least uh, one who you know takes over a nation and isn't handed the dictatorship by birthright, he was charismatic. Caesar and Cornelia will have a daughter named Julia Caesaris, uh, born in 76 BCE. In 75 BCE, Caesar travels to the Greek island of Rhodes. I would like to go there. Uh, to study oratory with a famous professor, uh, Apollonius, a Greek reta, oh my gosh, rhetorician. On the way there, he is captured by pirates off the coast of Asia Minor. Fucking pirates. Rome actually had all kinds of pirate problems off and on. And of course he did. There have been pirates, I imagine, as long as there have been boats. Uh, Roman historian Plutarch will later write about the capture of Caesar by these pirates. And maybe this account is true or maybe legend building. They told a lot of gunboat tales about the rulers back then. Anyway, he wrote, when the pirates demanded 20 talents for his ransom, Caesar laughed at them for not knowing who their captive was and of his own accord agreed to give them 50. Again, according to Plutarch, uh, Caesar spent time with his captors while the ransom was collected. Uh, he, quote, wrote poems and sundry speeches, which he read aloud to them. And those who did not admire these, he would call to their faces illiterate barbarians and often laughingly threatened to hang them all. The pirates were delighted by this, attributed his boldness of speech to a certain simplicity and boyish mirth. Uh, is, he, is he boyish? In his 20s here? He's talking shit against pirates who've captured him? I don't know. Uh, Caesar allegedly was not joking around. After his ransom was paid, Caesar, quote, immediately manned vessels and put to sea from the harbor of Miletus in modern-day Turkey against the robbers. He caught them, uh, still lying at anchor off the island, and he took the robbers out of prison and crucified them all just as he had often warned them. That is what one source says. Um, other sources say that he had some of the pirates' throats slit before they were crucified in a show of leniency. <laughs> Man, cutting their throats to be lenient. That sounds like a fucking Derek Skeet Skeet mullet move. Hey, motherfuckers, I know you kidnapped me and held me for ransom and shit, but we had some good times on that boat. So, because I like you, I'm going to slit a kiss your fucking throat a kisses. Uh, Caesar's, Caesar may have actually done that. It, it would have been a kindness. Being crucified was an extremely feared punishment at that time. And sometimes people were shown, quote unquote, mercy during executions by being killed quickly instead of being crucified. Uh, an execution method viewed by the Romans as particularly painful and disrespectful. Uh, you know, if they crucified you because they really did not like you. Sorry, Jesus. Feel compelled to say that. Uh, 74 BCE, fucking uh, Mithridates, king of Pontus. Uh, renews his war on Rome. Uh, and he was actually Mithridates the sixth. Sorry if you were very hung up by that, right? If you were just very confused about that. Wait, wh what? Hey, is he talking about Mithridates or Mithridates the sixth? I mean, he said Mithridates like as in the first, but the, the, the timeline just wouldn't be correct. If you actually wonder that, kudos. You are one of the world's greatest Pontus scholars. Uh, Caesar raised a private army to fight him, which boosted his reputation. He had it financed with money from Crassus, it seems. More on that later, a little connection. Uh, while Caesar was away from Rome, he uh, was made a member of the College of Pontiffs. He's back in the priesthood, baby. College of Pontiffs was a body of the ancient Roman state whose members were the highest ranking priests of the state religion. Uh, did the Catholic Church soon model their structure after this College of Pontiffs? It seems as if maybe they did. Uh, when Caesar returned from fighting Mithridates, he gained a spot in one of the uh, military tribuneships. And now Caesar began working with future triumvirate member Pompey, a.k.a. Uh, Gnaeus Pompeius, to undo the sullen constitution, which wasn't that unusual. Uh, they were constantly rewriting and tweaking laws back then. Pompey started off as uh, one of Sulla's lieutenants, uh, mentioned him fighting with him earlier, switched sides after Sulla's death. Very convenient. When Caesar returned to Rome, he used his family's money and his speaking and negotiating skills, excuse me, uh, to grow his power. According to Plutarch, he had a large and gradually increasing political influence in consequence of his lavish hospitality and the general splendor of his mode of life. Hitting those bathhouses, hosting big banquets, putting on little gladiator matches, all kinds of shit. He also became a pontifex in 73 BCE, a high ranking priest, prestige position, more than a full time job furthering his status as an important man in Rome. In 69 or 68 BCE, Caesar is elected quaestor. Quaestor, Latin for investigator. Uh, a quaestor was the lowest ranking regular magistrate in ancient Rome, whose traditional responsibility was the treasury. 
And according to Britannica, the questorship became the first magistrate, magistrate, oh my God, magistracy sought by ambitious young men. And Caesar, of course, had no shortage of ambition. Well, we're moving on. God, that always makes me feel good. Uh, during his time as quester, Caesar's first wife, Cornelia, dies in 69 BC. Caesar gave an oration at Cornelia's funeral that was uh, unusual at the time. Women didn't typically receive heartfelt tributes. Seriously. Uh, he did the same thing for an aunt who died as well. And people talked about the words he spoke to honor his wife and aunt. Uh, you know, often you know, the word got around and it increased his public appeal. Seems these words are lost to history. So that is a bummer. I tried to find those, but... Uh, they don't seem to be out there. You know, a lot of this stuff just didn't make it to us from down the years. Uh, I was able to find what Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet uh, wrote about one of the passings uh, of one of his wives. So <laughs> one of the passings as if one of his wives died multiple times, wrote about the passing of one of his wives. And he wrote, I cannot believe a cuss that she is dead a cuss and shit. I was just hitting that tight pussy cuss yesterday. God damn a cuss. Guess I'm single a cuss and ready to mingle a cuss. Who wants this hot, hard, olive oil, daddy dick? Because Derek had a way with words. Uh, Caesar, like Derek, gets over his wife pretty fast. Next year, in 67 BCE, he marries Pompeia, granddaughter of Sulla and relative of Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus. Another political marriage, it seems. Don't, don't hear the name Pompeia a lot anymore. Uh, who was she? What was she like? Uh, do not know much about her. Because again, ancient Rome plus vagina equals not much. Uh, 65 BCE, Caesar is elected Curl Idile. Oh my gosh, Curl Edile, a magistrate responsible for the maintenance of public buildings and regulation of public festivals. Uh, they also had powers to enforce public order and duties to ensure the city of Rome was well supplied and its civil infrastructure was well maintained. Well, we're on now. He's celebrating. Starts spending a lot of borrowed money, gathering more influence, spreads his name. Building his reputation as a man of the people. He's George Jefferson, motherfucker. Uh, after Caesar became, uh, oh my gosh, I hate this word, edile. It's just not spelled like, uh, anyway. Uh, he produced public games in the Circus Maximus, an ancient Roman chariot racing stadium, mass entertainment venue. I forgot about the Circus Maximus, right? They had the Colosseum and the Circus Maximus. Uh, putting on some big free shows, helped his public reputation and political ambitions, but also caused him to go into a lot of debt. Uh, Caesar also liked to spend big bucks on political gifts, right? Buy people's support, uh, as in bribe them. Uh, Plutarch wrote, he was unsparing in his outlays of money and he was thought to be purchasing a transient and short-lived fame at a great price. Though in reality, he was buying things of the highest value at a small price, right? He was spending a lot of money now to make a lot more money later. Uh, Ediles received special privileges like a fringe toga. Oh my a fancy symbolic curl chair, think a throne, but like way less cool, and the right to wear ancestral masks. So a bunch of pomp and circumstance showing others how cool your title is. Uh, ediles were ranked between tribunes and preachers. Becoming a curl edile was often a step towards becoming a consul or getting appointed to the Senate. In addition to entertaining, help, uh, again, in Caesar's time, uh, in addition to entertaining and helping take care of the city, repairing temples, public buildings, streets, sewers, aqueducts, etc., uh, they supervised traffic. They fucking supervised traffic back then. Supervised public decency and prevented fires. They were in charge of the provision markets, weights and measures, distribution of grain. Uh, Julius Caesar would add two plebeian ediles to help with all this. Uh, ediles also had judicial powers and could impose fines. Uh, Caesar is elected Pontifex Maximus, uh, an office he will keep to his death in 63 BCE. Pontifex Maximus, a member of the Council of Priests, like the top member of that council of priests in ancient Rome. He's in fucking charge now. now. He's got the biggest hat. He sits on the biggest chair. He's got the fucking coolest toga. Ha ha, boy. The College of the Pontifices was the, uh, uh, you know, very important uh, order of the priesthood charged with administering, you know, civil law regulating relations of the community with deities recognized by the state. And again, Pontifex Maximus, chief high priest of the College of Pontiffs. And again, not a full-time position, but a very important one. He was the guy most uh, in charge of keeping peace with the gods. He was the closest thing Rome had before Christianity to a pope, which unfortunately is not a great comparison since uh, this position was, you know, largely ceremonial and not uh, nearly 
even close to as powerful as Pope. Uh, he, you know, he helped your power or this position, I'm sorry, helped your power when combined with other positions though. He's really building quite the resume. 62 BCE, Caesar is elected Praetor. And again, Praetor was a judicial officer who had brought authority in cases of equity. The Praetor was responsible for public games, exercised authority in the government in the absence of consuls. So very important position. After a year of service, preachers usually became provincial governors and could make that fucking governor moolah. Make it out of a governor lasagna. Get the hands so greased in the palms. With the, sometimes you get the, the green stuff. I think it's a, I cannot think of the name of it. That is, is a green sauce. It's kind of like a dollar's a pesto. It's the pesto money is what I was trying to say. It's harder for me to speak in Italian than it is in, the, in English. I don't even know fucking why. I am doing Italian because this is Latin, which is a different language, as it turns out. Uh, but yeah, usually they would just, you know, become a governor, start making that governor money by plundering the provinces and, you know, taxing the fuck out of them. Uh, but then there was a big scandal in December of 62 BC that almost ruined Caesar's political ambitions. So weird what was considered scandalous at this time. Publius Claudius Pucher. Described by historians as a disruptive politician, head of a brand of, or head of a band of political thugs and bitter enemy of Cicero, uh, was in Caesar's house during the celebration of the rites of Bona Dea. Uh, this was a women-only celebration of a secretive deity of fruitfulness in the earth and in women. Her rites allowed women the use of strong wine and blood sacrifice, uh, things otherwise forbidden them by Roman tradition, and men were totally barred from her mysteries and the possession of her true name. We're a weird fucking species. How did this ever develop? Uh, also, I do think I know her true name. Hey, Lucifina. Well, old naughty Claudius snuck in and tried to do some peeping on some titties or something. He was found disguised as a female harpist. He was charged with incestum. I charge you with incestum. Not literal incest, just a term for a range of crimes of a sexually perverse nature. He was in there peeping and creeping and he was put on trial. And Caesar, over this, divorced his wife, Pompeia, because he suspected that she allowed him into the ceremony, uh, declaring that his wife, you know, can't ever do something like that, can't ever allow something like that to happen, that, quote, she must be above suspicion. Okay. Did she, did she let him in? Did he just worry that suspicion of her letting him in uh, would hurt his political ambitions? And uh, he just tossed her aside. Maybe it was uh, legitimate. He, you know, he was a high priest, essentially, can't be responsible for pissing off the gods, you know? I mean, he is lucky that a big fire or something didn't break out right after this and burn down Rome. He would have probably been blamed. Or was he looking just for an excuse to get rid of her and replace her? I don't know. Uh, Claudius claimed he was 90 miles away at the time of the ceremony, but Cicero, noted orator, a uh, Roman politician, had evidence he was there. Uh, however, Claudius was acquitted, scandal averted, but the divorce remained. From 61 to 60 BCE, Julius Caesar now becomes governor of what was referred to as Farther Spain, Andalusia and Portugal. Uh, during his time as governor and general there, did Caesar want to leave his wife so he could fuck around in Spain? Uh, he will defeat rival tribes, help stabilize Spain for Rome, that area of Spain, win the loyalty of his soldiers. This is big. This is putting him on the, on the path to the glory he wants. No longer a uh, local magistrate. Now as governor, uh, he becomes a general, leading men to victories in battle, making some cash, really building his legend. While in Spain, Caesar will read about Alexander the Great. As I mentioned before, he will weep. When his friends asked him why he, uh, you know, uh, is reacting this way, he said, while Alexander at my age was already king of so many peoples, I have as yet achieved no brilliant success. Ambitious dude, wants it bad. And not to pile on Caesar, but uh, I think you're around 40 here. And Alexander died when he was 32. So he had, you know, not just done more by your age, he had actually done more by the time you were quite a bit younger. Uh, Caesar was also probably sad because he was starting to fall into pretty, pretty severe debt despite his, uh, military, uh, you know, con early conquests. Every time he got elected to a new position, he spent a fuck ton of borrowed money on public projects, you know, bribes, games, other benefits. And a lot of the money he's borrowing has uh, been coming from Crassus before he left for f uh, farther Spain. Some of Caesar's creditors wouldn't actually let him leave Rome until his wealthy ally, uh, Marcus Licinius Crassus lended him more money bailing him out of debt, a uh, quarter of his total debt. Uh, and then a military expedition beyond the province would allow Caesar to get money for himself. Soldiers have some left over by uh, fucking up some more non-Romans. 60 BCE, Caesar returns to Rome victorious, could pay his debts, and was really starting to make a name for himself. And then he will become consul in 59 BCE. But first, 
in 60, uh, 50, uh, in 60 BCE, uh, Caesar forms the now famous. It also messes with me in BCE sometimes as I'm going through a timeline that the numbers are inverted. So a lot of my policy is like, wait, what? Oh yeah, we have to go smaller to pass time. Uh, 60 BCE, Caesar forms the now famed first triumvirate with Pompey and Marcus Licinius Crassus. And this was not an official thing. Before getting into this, I actually thought it was. Uh, no, they didn't become like named like the three musketeers or anything. They weren't given like fancier togas, you know, cooler chairs. Uh, the first triumvirate was an informal political alliance among three prominent politicians in the late Roman Republic. Uh, but yeah, informal. What? Why did they form it? Obviously, so these three hot, throbbing, drizzled in olive oil father daddies could lay around and feed each other grapes and dick. Call 1-900-OLIVE-OIL-DADDY-DICK for all the steamy, creamy, daddy-on-daddy, one-more-daddy action you can handle. Uh, or did they change laws to help each other's uh, pocketbooks and political ambitions? Uh, the Constitution of the Roman Republic had a lot of veto points, and shit could get you know bogged down very easily. So in order to bypass constitutional obstacles and force through political goals of the three men, they forged this secret alliance where they promised to use their respective influence to support each other's goals. The triumvirate, uh, again, not a formal magistry. Magistrate. Oh, fuck. I hate that word. Uh, not a formal, not a formal legal thing. Uh, let's learn a bit about the other two heads of this snake now. Crassus was a Roman politician who lived from 115 BCE to 53 BCE. Crassus's death will lead to the start of the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. Uh, Crassus, also known as the richest man in Rome, he and Caesar had worked together a while. He funded financing uh, Caesar's successful election to do a variety of offices, uh, like uh, Pontifex Maximus, supported Caesar's efforts to win command of military campaigns. Uh, he'd been censor in 65 BCE, a uh, very known, very powerful man, and crooked as fuck. Made money in a lot of shitty ways. <laughs> this is insane. Uh, he formed a personal fire brigade back when there were almost uh, daily fires in Rome and not uh, a bunch of state-funded firefighters. And these dickheads would head out to burning buildings and instead of putting them out by uh, putting the fire out, they would quickly offer a, uh, a, an option to buy the home that is burning from the owner at a discounted rate. Like I imagine the price would just keep dropping quickly as the owner took a second to decide. If the owner sold quickly, they would then put out the fire if the owner wouldn't sell, they would just let it burn to the ground. They would just stand and watch the fire burn to the ground, then offer to buy the property for almost nothing. Uh, Crassus also had bought a bunch of slaves who were architects and builders, and he would then rebuild the home and rent it. And he just did this in mass. He had a team of at least 500 architects and builders. And by doing this, he would end up owning more land by far than anyone else in ancient Rome before he died. His wealth at its peak was said to equal the annual revenue for the Roman Republic insane so he was like you know he was there fucking you know money wise uh bill gates jeff bezos elon musk you know warren buffett you know whoever has the most money right now in 87 bce crassus had fled rome after uh, gaius Mar marius briefly captured the city while Sulla was out of town he had supported Sulla during that civil war quickly returned to rome to help Sulla take power in 82 bce crassus at this time got into conflict with pompey because Sulla preferred pompey to him and a rivalry was born and then Caesar would be able to mend this fence somewhat to form that first triumvirate. Uh, Crassus elected Praetor in 73 BCE from 72 to 71 BC, helped down put the infamous Spartacus slave uprising. Uh, but Pompey would get most of the credit for doing that. Crassus and Pompey both elected consul in 70 BCE. During their time in office, they overthrew some parts of the Sullen constitution. During the 60s, Crassus was working on building his political following. He had earned even more money from selling property that had been confiscated by Sulla. Dude took property, uh, property in a variety of ways. And he used his wealth to give credit to senators, you know, give them loans and other political figures uh, who were in debt. One of them being, of course, Julius Caesar. And now let's meet Pompey, Pompey the Great. Pompey was a Roman politician who lived from 106 BCE to September 28th, 48 BCE. Uh, Pompey the Great, also known as Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, was a statesman and general, well-respected general. Uh, you know, good military mind. Pompey came from a noble family, uh, given the nickname the Great by his soldiers in Africa in the 80s BCE. Pompey's father, Pompeius Strabo, sided with Gaius Marius during the civil war between Marius and Sulla. After Pompey's father died, he detached himself from Marius' supporters. In 83 BCE, Pompey fought with Sulla as an independent ally in his campaign to get Rome back from the Marians. 
Pompey was tasked with getting Sicily and Africa back, which he did in 82 and 81 BCE, you now Northern Africa. Pompey executed many Marian leaders who surrendered. From his palace in Africa, Pompey demanded that he receive a triumph in Rome before returning, uh, triumph being a civil ceremony and a religious rite of ancient Rome held to publicly celebrate and sanctify the success of a military commander who had led Roman victories, uh, Roman forces to victory in the service of the state or in some historical traditions, uh, one who had successfully completed a foreign war. And you'd get like a big parade, uh, you know, just a big celebration of what you did when you came back to Rome. So this daddy wasn't coming home until some proper daddy honor was bestowed upon him. Uh, He refused to disband his army, traveled to Rome to get Sulla to yield to his demand. After Sulla abdicated, Pompey then supported Marcus uh, Lepidus for consulship in 78 BCE. But when Lepidus attempted a revolution, Pompey sided with the rest of the government. God, back then, there's always being like forced to choose, you know, these fucking squabbles that could just erupt into civil wars and battles. Uh, he still refused to disband his army, used it to pressure the Senate to send him to Spain to fight Marian leader Sertorius there. Pompey's influence now spreads through Spain, north, southern Gaul, northern Italy, through conquest. Pompey then takes his soldiers back to Italy with him, helps put down the Spartacus revolt, a move that helped him get elected as consul in 70 BCE. 66 BCE, Pompey was given command of the war against Mithridates, with full power to make war and peace. And Mithridates the sixth, of course, uh, died in 63 BCE. And then Pompey had free reign to consolidate Eastern provinces and frontier kingdoms. And pretty funny how Mithridates died. Uh, he, (laughs) some local nobles who he'd conquered were revolting against him and he knew he was going to be killed and he didn't have the means to defend himself. So he drank some poison, which is what leaders did back then to avoid being paraded around in a Ford city and tortured and all that stuff. But he had spent years building up an immunity to poison. So he couldn't drink enough poison to die. Ain't that a bitch. So he had to end up asking a friend to uh, cut him down with a sword. Uh, Back to Pompey, the organization of the East would go down as Pompey's greatest achievement. His sound appreciation of the geographical and political factors involved enabled him to impose an overall settlement that was to form the basis of the defensive frontier system for the Roman Empire later, uh, you know, that would last for around uh, 500 years. Pompey received another triumph in 61 BC, gets another party, which is actually his third overall now. And then according to Britannica, the following decade was the period of his ascendancy in Italy, an ascendancy that was to be eroded through Caesar's growing military power and gradual capture of Pompey's worldwide patronage. Formed the power uh, from the power base Caesar in turn created in Northern Italy and Gaul. So basically, Pompey was a fucking badass. Just not quite as slick as Caesar and fell in his shadow, despite kicking uh, a, a lot of ass. Right? He was fucking, he was fucking Scotty Pippen. You know, Caesar uh, was Jordan. You now, Scotty Pippen was a great basketball player, but he had to play next to Jordan so people don't respect him as much. Uh, why did Pompey ally himself with Caesar? Well, he wanted to use Caesar to get what he wanted. Uh, Crassus agreed to give Caesar financial assistance in exchange for political support, which is what he wanted, why he wanted to join. All three of these guys would use each other all hoping to play the best chess game and come out on top in the end with this triumvirate. Pompey would marry Caesar's daughter Julia in 59 BCE to strengthen their alliance. Uh, Caesar forced through two land bills to benefit him. Uh, Pompey and Caesar's daughter Julia married in 59 BCE to seal the alliance. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I already said. uh, In 59 BCE, Caesar is elected consul now. Big position, as mentioned previously. Uh, That year, Pompey sealed the alliance by marrying Caesar's daughter. Uh, Caesar then married Calpurnia, daughter of future consul Lucius Piso. Calpurnia would be his wife for the rest of his life, even though Caesar would have uh, several affairs. He'd been having affairs this entire time. There's so many things to his life. As consul, Caesar proposes government reforms, land redistribution to the poor, uh, redistribution. His legislation aligns with the populares and helps his buddies. World History Encyclopedia writes, his initiatives were supported by Crassus, uh, by Crassus's wealth and Pompey's soldiers, thus solidly aligning the first triumvirate with the popular faction. As long as Caesar was a public servant, he was safe from prosecution by his optimates uh, enemies for some legal indiscretions. But once his consulship ended, he was sure to be indicted. Further, uh, Caesar was deeply in debt, both financially and politically, to Crassus and needed to raise both money and prestige. And this debt is mainly what would take Caesar into Gaul. Uh, During his time as consul, Caesar introduced a bill for allotment of public lands in Italy, which would help Pompey's soldiers get land. I should say take him back to Gaul. 
Uh, the bill was vetoed by three tribunes uh, of the plebes. Caesar then got some of Pompey's veterans to riot, which intimidated the government into allowing the land uh, distribution. Then a tribune of the plebes, uh, Publius Vatinus, uh, Vatinius, an agent of Caesar, helped ratify Pompey's settlement of the East. Caesar initiated an act that would punish any misconduct by the provincial governors. An act negotiated by Publius Vatinius gave uh, Cisalpine, Gaul, and more to Caesar. In 58 BCE, the governor of another province in Gaul, Transalpine Gaul, dies, and Caesar takes control of that as well. Now he's going to make a lot of money. Uh, Caesar recruits from Cisalpine Gaul and will use Transalpine Gaul as a springboard for conquest beyond Rome's northwest frontier. And so now this is when he really builds the biggest bulk of his legend. Uh, 58 BCE, Caesar is properly appointed governor of Gaul. He commands a large army and participates in the Gallic Wars from 58 to 50 BCE, where he will conquer and stabilize Gaul and help cement his reputation as a formidable and ruthless leader. His key leadership qualities were his decisiveness, uh, a readiness to cost caution aside when needed, and his excellent relationship with his troops. He was very generous to his soldiers, and they in return were very loyal to him and loved him. Uh, today, Caesar is still considered by many to be one of the greatest military commanders to have ever lived. Uh, he was very brave, not afraid of combat himself, brave enough that uh, he once grabbed a shield and personally joined the fighting uh, at the front during the Battle of Sabus in modern northern France. This, The morale boost from doing this was enormous. Uh, at that time, in warfare, generals no longer fought in personal combat, but he did on occasion. Uh, Caesar built a bridge across the Rhine River into Germanic territories, kicked some ass up there, crossed the English Channel, entered Britain, uh, invaded Britain twice, actually, and was also fucking ruthless. Uh, according to Biography.com, as he expanded his reach, Caesar was ruthless with his enemies. In one instance, he waited until his opponent's water supply had dried up, then ordered the hands of all the remaining survivors be cut off. That seems almost worse than just killing them back then. You know, they can't take care of themselves with no fucking hands. Not like they could work as motivational speakers or foot models back then. Not a lot of great hand prosthetics, I'm guessing, over 2,000 years ago. Man, Caesar, he could be a mean daddy. Real naughty daddy when he wanted to be. Uh, Caesar's campaign in Gaul, believed to have, uh, you know, uh, by some sources, to have led to the enslavement or death of over 1 million people. Uh, Caesar's successes in Gaul led to resentment as well between himself and Pompey because his legend is growing larger than Pompey's. Uh, Caesar will later, two years before he's killed, list the number of enemy soldiers killed in all his battles, uh, not just Gaul, at almost 1.2 million people. My God, that didn't include random fucking civilians. Historian and Brown University professor Kurt Rothlob wrote about the con... <laughs> Sorry, Kurt, you, you're a very smart guy. I don't know. Your name doesn't... Okay. Rothlob. Mr. Rothlob. What does Rothlob sounds like? <laughs> sounds like someone who's, who's exhausted. Oh, how you doing, Kurt? Oh, I'm Rothlob. I'm a real Rothlob right now. Uh, he wrote of the conquest of Gaul saying, it was not only the Roman sword that inflicted death on the Gallic population. Large parts starved to death because the harvests were confiscated or destroyed and their settlements and farmsteads burned or they froze to death when the regions, when the legions drove them out of their settlements in winter and burned down buildings, villages, and towns. Fuck. Life back in these times, man, it was rough. Ruthless motherfuckers abounded. Uh, Caesar documented his campaign in a series of books titled The Gallic Wars. In these books, he claimed that he attempted to make truces and agreements uh, with the tribes in Gaul, but also admitted that he wasn't against harming civilians. Caesar wrote that when one Gallic tribe with the name, I'm not even going to fucking attempt, fled from his uh, forces, he burned all their villages and houses and cut down their corn. He also wrote, damage should be done to the enemy in ravaging their lands. He just did whatever was necessary to uh, dominate these people. 52 BCE, Caesar completes his conquest of Gaul with the Battle of Elysia. The Battle of Elysia was fought in September of 52 BCE. Julius Caesar and his legions defeated a Gallic army under Vercingetorix. <laughs> this guy's name I want to spell this guy's name for you this guy's name is V-E-R-C-I-N G-E-T O-R-I-X Vercingetorix uh, Gallic chief historian Tom Holland uh, wrote about the victory of Elysia saying above the palisades lay the bodied above the palisades lay the bodies of warriors cut down by the legions and beyond them piled around the outer fortification stretching away from Elysia for miles were innumerable corpses sounds just dystopian some insane horror movie shit the next day Vercingetorix uh, surrendered to Caesar and was taken in chains to Rome and then uh, paraded through the city during Caesar's triumph 
right? That was part of these parades too. When you like uh, had a triumph, a lot of times you like, like important, like notable enemies would be in fucking cages. It's like a weird fucking Macy's day parade where they're just like sad people that have been defeated in war in cages and a victorious general. Uh, and then this, uh, guy, Vercingetorix uh, spent the next six years in prison before eventually just being executed by strangulation. Uh, after his defeat, there were a few skirmishes, but the Gauls had been effectively defeated. While Caesar was busy conquering Gaul, he didn't forget about his political career back home. He wanted to keep his political position, so he used money from the Gallic Wars to hire political agents to protect his interests back home, make sure everyone knew he was out there kicking a lot of ass, doing a lot of great shit, and he'd be home soon. Uh, meanwhile, things not going well within the triumvirate. Pompey, not again, not a fan of Caesar's growing military reputation and Crassus and Pompey still hate each other and don't have uh, Caesar around to kind of, you know, uh, smooth things over. In April of 56 BCE, the three men hold a conference inside the province of Cisalpine Gaul. In 56 BCE, uh, Publius Claudius, that fucking weasel who once tried to sneak into Lucifina's lady party and pee on some titties, had persuaded Pompey that Crassus was trying to kill him. That's where they had this meeting. Crassus was alarmed at Pompey's suspicions and went to meet Caesar. Then Caesar brought Pompey and Crassus to this conference where they reconciled. They all agreed that Pompey and Crassus would serve as consuls now in 55 BCE and they would put laws into effect that would prolong Caesar's provincial commands for five more years. So we have five more years worth of money. And it would also give Crassus a five-year term in Syria to build his legend there and Pompey a five-year term in Spain. They could all make lots of fucking dollars. Oh, to make it a lot of pesto, the money, the grease of the palm of Antonio Banderas. And they all agreed to keep a close eye on a, another Roman growing in power, a formidable daddy, and threat to all of their ambitions. Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. One on three, motherfuckers, a cuss. Let's get in the ring, a cuss. I'll break some fucking necks, a cusses. No, of course not. But I like picturing, <laughs> I like picturing some like Danny McBride type character in like Roman garb. It's like, come on, fucking bring it. Um, Caesar's daughter, Julia dies in 54 BCE now during childbirth, Pompey's wife. Uh, this does not help the alliance between Pompey and Caesar. Then out of fucking nowhere, Crassus is killed in 53 BCE in a battle in Syria, which leads to the end of the first triumvirate, right? Fucking Parthians got him a ancient Persian empire. He'd been betrayed by an Armenian king. Uh, it said that while he was uh, really good at making money, not the military leader that Pompey or Caesar were. Pompey now, rather than continue with his alliance with Caesar, starts cozying up to the nobles in Rome who also hate Caesar. Fucking sneaky daddy. Now that he's no longer married to Caesar's daughter, just doesn't care. Probably wouldn't have cared if they stayed together. It's all very Game of Thrones. Everyone's out for themselves. You know, both these guys want the Iron Throne. Pompey sides with the Optimates, uh, tees, Optimates and uh, also now is the sole military and political leader actually in Rome of note. Uh, Pompey now has the Senate terminate Caesar's governorship of Gaul and order Caesar to return as a private citizen, which means he could be prosecuted for whatever bullshit Pompey and the Senate was cooking up, which they were. So now Caesar kind of has to take shit over, right? It's either that or run and hide or die in all likelihood. Excuse me. Uh, 50 BCE, Caesar requests permission from the Senate to stand for re-election while still in Gaul, where he's safe, surrounded by his army, and the Senate refuses. They demand that he return to Rome, right? They backed him into a corner. And no one puts baby daddy in a corner, especially not this hot olive oil, jacked, shredded hard, seductively hanging that toga off his dick and not letting a single thread touch the ground. Baby daddy. Uh, January 1st, 49 BC, the Senate receives a proposal from Caesar that he and Pompey lay down their command simultaneously. Nope, they don't go for it. So now the Senate decides that Caesar will be treated as a public enemy of Rome if he does not lay down his command by a set date. What were they thinking? Of course, war is coming now. On January 10th, 49 BCE, Caesar and his army crossed the Rubicon River in northern Italy and marched towards Rome. The Rubicon was the border between Gaul and Rome. Caesar was not legally allowed to command troops past the Rubicon River, which is why this was a big deal. It was a declaration of war. Now, after Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix, he will become the second man to try and take the Roman Republic over by force. Some records say that when Caesar crossed the Rubicon River, he said his famous quote, the die is cast. I hope he said it like that too. The die is cast. And they're like, what? Oh, uh, uh, the die is cast. I don't know. Sorry. What? what? I'm sorry. You're talking to me? Uh, this marked the beginning of the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. In February 49 BC, Pompey and other senators flee to Greece, but not Derek Skeet Skeet Mullet. 
He decides to stand and fight alone. One man, one mullet, two pecs, capable of pushing an entire army back to Spain. One dick, ready to skull fuck Caesar into oblivion. One mullet, able to deflect any arrow. Two balls, made of steel and fire. Yes, fire. This daddy had the hardest, hottest balls in Rome. I'll stop. From March to August 49 BC, Caesar defeats Pompey's loyal forces where Spain rests. From April to September, same year, Caesar defeats his forces where France now sits. By 48 BC, Pompey is long gone from Italy, right? He's fled, uh, ends up in Greece. Uh, Caesar and his army now chase Pompey, uh, first through Spain, then Greece, then eventually Egypt. Uh, July 10th, 48 BCE, Caesar is actually forced to retreat at the Battle of Dyrrhachium against Pompey and, uh, oh my gosh, Macedonia. Uh, but then just one minor setback. He's going to push forward. August 9th, 48 BC, Caesar defeats Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalus in Greece, causing Pompey to now flee to Egypt. Some sources say over 60,000 Romans died in this battle. Uh, Caesar was outnumbered by Pompey's infantry and cavalry, but his military strategies won the battle and cemented his reputation, according to some historians, as one of the greatest commanders in history. In an effort to prevent Caesar from invading Egypt, the young Egyptian king Ptolemy XIII has Pompey assassinated on September 28th, 48 BCE. King Ptolemy was one of uh, Pompey's former clients, actually. Pompey hoped that Ptolemy uh, would help him out, but Ptolemy was afraid of offending Caesar and incurring his wrath. Right? He's betting on the right horse. Caesar arrives in Egypt soon after Pompey's death and is given Pompey's head. And instead of being overjoyed, he's sad. Uh, which surprises King Ptolemy, right? He's sad because, you know, there were enemies, but also friends. He and Pompey had a long, complicated relationship. Also surprising Ptolemy, Caesar decides to stay for a while. And more surprising, Caesar decides to fuck his sister wife. Well, we're moving on up, moving on up to the east side. And not Caesar's uh, sister wife, because he didn't have one of those Ptolemies. Cleopatra, noise. Uh, and yes, sister wife is correct. Back in Suck 122, uh, I covered pretty thoroughly how absurdly incestuous the Ptolemies were. Uh, Caesar declared himself executor shortly after arriving in Egypt of Ptolemy XII's uh, will, Ptolemy XIII and Cleopatra's father, ballsy, does whatever he wants, and orders Cleopatra and Ptolemy to appear before him to settle their feud. Cleopatra had uh, fled to uh, Syria uh, to avoid you know, being killed by her brother. Caesar sends for her. Um, you know, because she's in exile. And then she's smuggled into the Egyptian palace inside a laundry bag. And when she comes out of that laundry bag, she is hot. And daddy liked what daddy saw. Uh, from late 48 BCE to January 47th uh, BCE. Oh my God. January 47th to January 47 BCE. What am I talking about? Caesar was involved in a romantic relationship with Queen Cleopatra in Egypt and helped put her back on the throne. Uh, Caesar's legions fought her brother's Egyptian army. Uh, Caesar and Cleopatra remained inside her palace in Alexandria now for six months until reinforcements arrive in March of 47 BCE and help defeat the Egyptian forces. Uh, Cleopatra, part of the uh, Macedonian dynasty that took over Egypt in the late 4th century BCE. Her father, King Ptolemy XII, died in 51 BCE, left the kingdom to Cleopatra when she was 18, and her brother, Ptolemy XIII, who was 10, they got married, which was normal at the time, but also gross. And during the beginning of the reign, Egypt struggled with economic troubles, floods, famine, and political conflict. And Cleopatra and her brother uh, have their own conflicts. Of course they do, right? They're siblings, husband and wife, and he's a little kid. How could they not have so many problems? Uh, she's forced to flee to Syria, as I mentioned, where she uh, tried to gather an army to attempt to defeat her brother, take the throne back for herself. Uh, their affair alliance would end with the death of Cleopatra's brother and Cleopatra on the throne, as in uh, Caesar and Cleopatra. So why would Caesar do this? Like just to get laid? No, of course not. He needed money. Uh, he had been leading a huge army all over the Western world, trying to kill Pompey. And now he needed to go back to Rome, take it over. Cleopatra needed soldiers and she had a lot of money. She is believed to have been the world's richest woman at the time and able to finance Caesar's return to power in Rome. So it worked out very well for both of them. Everything political and calculated with Caesar, but also they did fuck a bunch. Uh, but maybe that was political too, right? Seal the deal between them uh, with a child. Uh, Cleopatra and Caesar would have a son together, uh, Caesarian. Julius Caesar's son, Caesarian, little Caesar, born on June 23rd, 47 BCE. Some people dispute this was his son, but most historians and uh, contemporaries do think this was uh, this, this you know child was his son. Uh, Cleopatra declared him her heir, successor to the throne. However, Caesar refused to acknowledge him as his son. I mean, he is still married back in Rome. Uh, Caesarian will live from 47 to 30 BCE. 
His death will be ordered by Octavian, Caesar's adopted son. Caesar also Octavian's great uncle and Octavian will later become the first Roman emperor, uh, Augustus. Transitioning back to Caesar, who after helping Cleopatra spent the next few years fighting the last of Pompey's supporters in the Middle East, Africa, and Spain. Uh, finally, in 47 BC, Caesar now briefly fights a war in northeastern uh, Anatolia with the king of the Sumerian Bosporus, who are trying to take over the kingdom of Pontus. Uh, fights them because uh, why the fuck not? You know, he's on his way to Rome anyway. Might as well do a little more uh, plundering. Build his legend a little more. Uh, Caesar's most famous quote, I came, I saw, I conquered, comes from his account of this military campaign. He is fucking on a roll. He is kicking ass. April of, 46, uh, April of 46 BC, Caesar defeats Pompey loyalists at Thap- Thapsus in modern day Tunisia. In July of 46 BC, Caesar now returns to Rome after winning against the Optimates, the opposition party uh, or ideological thought. His, op- his opposition, however you want to phrase it. Uh, Caesar names his great nephew, Gaius Octavius Thurnius, as his heir, not his son, Caesarian, as I mentioned. However, Caesar brings does bring Cleopatra, Caesarian, and her entourage to Rome and gives them a home. Uh, he was a frequent romantic visitor, visitor to her when she stayed, despite still being married to Calpurnia. Many members of the Senate do not like this, right? There are laws against bigamy in Rome. They don't, they don't care for the optics. Caesar doesn't care what they think. Now in 46 BC, Caesar is made dictator of Rome for 10 years. With control of the army and the love of the Roman people, the Senate, uh, nor anyone else, is in a position to stop this from happening. Uh, He is also, uh, after so many military triumphs, now the wealthiest man in Rome. As dictator, Caesar will make reforms that will benefit the lower middle classes, though, including regulating the distribution of subsidized grain, increasing the size of the Senate to represent more people, reducing government debt, supporting military veterans, Uh, granting Roman citizenship to people in Rome's far-flung territories, reforming the Roman tax codes, and creating the Julian calendar. Caesar, while he ruled, also resurrected two destroyed city-states, Carthage, which uh, not that uh, far in the past had equaled Rome in size and prestige, and Corinth. Uh, He even invited some of his former rivals into the government, but the majority of the Senate were his allies. Caesar spoke first at assembly meetings and had Roman coins made with his face on them in an effort to solidify his power and rule first Roman ruler to do that. The lower and middle classes liked Caesar, but the nobles feared that he was on his way to becoming a king and taking away their power. Caesar reformed land distribution for the poor, land reform for veterans that would not displace other citizens. He abolished the tax system that was in uh, there be, you know, prior to this and more. And in 46 BCE, uh, not only did he mint coins, he minted the largest quantity of gold coins in Roman history, really getting his face out there. After the Civil War, there was widespread debt in Rome. Lenders demanded repayment for loans and the value of real estate decreased. This led to a coin shortage, so Caesar made a shit ton more coins and ordered the property be accepted for repayment of loans at pre-war value and reinstated the law that forbade anyone to have more than 60,000 sesters in cash. I'd give myself a faulty pronunciation guide earlier for sesters. That's why I was like blank on that word earlier. Uh, Also canceled interest payments. Due since the beginning of 49 BC, BCE that allowed tenants to go a year without paying rent. So he was a man of the people, at least a man who knew that it was in his best political interest to have the people love and support him. Uh, to address an, unemplo- an unemployment crisis, Caesar, uh, Caesar offered lower class people an opportunity to travel to Rome's uh, other colonies. Uh, he drastically decreased the number of people allowed to collect free grain rations from 320,000 to 150,000, but did improve access to overseas grain by constructing a new harbor and a new canal. So it seems like he did a lot of good shit. Had uh, new public buildings constructed to help reduce unemployment and to beautify Rome after seeing the great city of Alexandria. He sought to divert the Tiber River to prevent flooding and planned to build a temple of Mars, a theater, a library, and more, but will be killed before any of these projects are completed. Uh, Caesar stipulated that his villa, gardens, and art gallery become public places, also left uh, three, uh, 300,000 sesters to every Roman citizen after his death. In April of 46 BCE, Caesar celebrates an unprecedented quadruple triumph in Rome, the victorious end of four wars. So shortly before he's killed, I mean, he is just at the top of the top. The morning of September 21st was a day of celebration for the citizens of Rome, right? Caesar was about to claim the highest honor a Roman could achieve, uh, a triumph, or receive, excuse me, a triumph, a spectacular celebration, which would be, you know, paraded through the streets, flaunting his prisoners of war, spoils of victory, as I mentioned earlier. This day promised to be like none other before it. It was the first of four triumphs, all held to honor Caesar. Over the next two weeks, Rome would look forward to three more giant parades. 
And then Caesar was to leave to Rome or was to leave Rome in November to deal with a bit of resistance in farther Spain. The Battle of Munda, uh, which he will win on March 17th, 45 BCE, and that'll be his final battle. After returning again victorious to Rome, Caesar declares himself now dictator for life in February of 44 BCE. And now a group of senators conspire to kill him because they fear Caesar having absolute power. They're ideologically opposed to this, uh, worried about him becoming king, probably feared he would eventually kill them perhaps, or at least thwart their political ambitions. So there were a lot of reasons. Well, what's very interesting to me is uh, he had given some of these same senators clemency when he had returned and taken Rome, right? When he came back from Egypt earlier, senators who had opposed his return, senators who probably, if he would have just, you know, walked back from uh, when he was in uh, Gaul, probably had him killed. Uh, After seizing Rome, Caesar wanted to do things differently than Sulla had, right? He was harsh and oppressive. Uh, When he came, when he came and took Rome, he had about 5,000 of his enemies murdered. Uh, Most of them rich people confiscated their property. And then Sulla, after doing all that, would not be killed in revenge. Well, uh, you know, Caesar was actually even one of the people who had to go in hiding from Sulla, barely escaped with his life, which we talked about. But Caesar was was determined to be a different kind of dictator. Unlike Sulla, Caesar was actually, ironically, a populist. And one of the first principles of populism is letting people live. Rather than have his enemies killed, he offered them mercy, clemency. As Caesar wrote to one of his advisors, let this be our new method of conquering to fortify ourselves by mercy and generosity. Well, that wouldn't work out too well for him. Uh, Caesar pardoned most of his enemies, forbade confiscating their property, uh, even promoted some of them to high public office. Marcus Brutus and Gaius Cassius would be two of the men he pardoned for opposing his rule, uh, could have had them killed, and they will be the ones who will lead the rebellion against him. Caesar had plans to leave Rome again, March 18th, for a military campaign in what is now Iraq. He planned to avenge Crassus's losses there. Dude wanted to fucking conquer everyone. He's 55 years old now, not slowing down. But Caesar was assassinated in the Roman Senate house on March 15th, 44 BC by a group of nobles led by Gaius Cassius and Marcus Junius Brutius. Sorry, bad timing for that button. Those motherfuckers, those men he'd shown mercy to. Uh, Cassius and Brutus called themselves the Liberators as they uh, began their plan to get rid of Caesar. When Cassius served as Quester in 53 BCE, he served under Marcus, oh my gosh, Licinius Crassus. Uh, Crassus uh, became tribune in, oh my God, sorry, sorry. There's some of these fucking words. My mind just starts to turn mush. Cassius became tribune in 49 BCE during the civil war. Cassius commanded part of Pompey's fleet. But after Pompey was defeated in 48 BCE, he reconciled with Caesar and was made uh, legate. Didn't have a pronunciation guide for that one. My bad. In 44 BCE, Cassius became praetor and was promised governorship of Syria. Cassius was offended when Marcus Brutus was appointed praetor urbanus. Uh, Cassius now became one of the lead conspirators against Caesar. Marcus Brutus was born around 85 BCE, died in 42 BCE. He was the second leader in the conspiracy to assassinate Caesar. Brutus was the son of Marcus Brutus, who was killed by Pompey in 77 BCE. Also a son of one of Caesar's many lovers, but probably his, uh, his main, uh, I guess, side piece lover, even though that's a, I hate that term, uh, Servilia. Brutus had originally sided with Pompey against Caesar, but he was encouraged to join the government after Pompey's defeat. Uh, Servilia was born around 100 BCE. Same as Caesar. She was, according to one historical account, one of the grand women of Rome's late Republican period and reportedly Caesar's favorite mistress for about 20 years. According to Britannica, he was more impressed by her mind than her beauty. There were rumors that Brutus was actually Caesar's son, but that's unlikely because Caesar was only 15 years older than Brutus. So much to Caesar's life. It would take a three or four parter. It would take an entire season to get into everything. It's like his life was a fucking soap opera combined with an action movie franchise. Uh, Brutus was shocked when Caesar declared himself perpetual dictator and greatly opposed the idea of one man having that much power. In the winter of 44 BCE, Cassius started the conspiracy to kill Caesar. And over 60 Romans will join the plot. On the morning of March 15th, Caesar decides not to go to the Senate meeting. He might have heard rumors about a conspiracy. So the conspirators uh, sent Decimus, another conspirator, a friend of Caesar, to convince Caesar to attend. And he was successful. After Caesar is killed, Decimus will have his gladiators act as a private police force to protect the assassins. Uh, Some people supported the assassins, but Caesar's supporters will overpower them. Decimus will have to flee Rome, uh, tries to lead an army in North Italy, uh, defend what he saw as the cause of the Republic, but Decimus 
within two years will eventually be overpowered by Caesar's heir Octavian, captured and executed. Back on March 15th, right, the Ides of March, the 74th day in the Roman calendar, a day traditionally marked by several religious observances and notable in Rome as a deadline for settling debts. So maybe symbolic. A group of senators led by Gaius Cassius, right, Decimus, Junius, Brutus, Albinus, Marcus Brutus, stabbed Caesar 23 times. Uh, What's crazy is that Caesar gave clemency to his former enemies and allowed them to remain in the Senate. Those enemies would conspire to kill him after he became dictator for life. Caesar's blood spilled onto the Senate floor at the feet of a statue of his friend and enemy, Pompey. The phrase, beware the Ides of March, later comes from Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar. According to ancient historian Plutarch, uh, the group of senators distracted Caesar by presenting different petitions to him. A senator named Tullius grabbed Caesar's toga with both hands, pulled it down from his neck, and that was the signal to begin the attack. A senator named Casca stabbed Caesar in the neck. Others surrounded Caesar, stabbed him in all directions. Brutus stabbed Caesar in the groin. Fucking daddy was a dirty dick stabber. Uh, Plutarch wrote about the assassination saying, it is said that he, Caesar, received 23 stab wounds and many of the conspirators were wounded by one another as they struggled to plant all those blows in one body. Uh, Greek Greek historian uh, Nicholas of Damascus wrote about the death of Caesar a few years after the fact, spoke with people who were present that day. Here's his account. The conspirators never met openly, but they assembled a few a time, a few at a time in each other's homes. There were many discussions and proposals, as might be expected, while they investigated how and where to execute their design. Some suggested that they should make the attempt as he was going along the sacred way, which was one of his favorite walks. Another idea was for it to be done at the elections during which he had to cross a bridge to appoint the magistrates in the campus Martius. They should draw lots for some to push him from the bridge and for others to run up and kill him. A third plan was to wait for a coming gladiatorial show. The advantage of that would be that because of the show, no suspicion would be aroused if arms were seen prepared for the attempt. But the majority opinion favored killing him while he sat in the Senate, where he would be by himself since non-senators would not be admitted, and where the many conspirators could hide their daggers beneath their togas. This plan won the day. His friends were alarmed at certain rumors and tried to stop him going to the Senate House, as did his doctors, for he was suffering from one of his occasional dizzy spells. His wife, Calpurnia, especially, who was frightened by some visions in her dreams, clung to him and said that she would not let him go that day. But Brutus, one of his one of the conspirators who was then thought of as a firm friend, came up and said, What is this, Caesar? Are you a man to pay attention to a woman's dreams and the idle gossip of stupid men and to insult the Senate by not going out, although it has honored you and has been specially summoned by you? But listen to me, cast aside the forebodings of all these people and come. The Senate has been in session waiting for you since early this morning. This swayed Caesar and he left. Interesting, this is a little different account than, you know, the uh, other account. Uh, Before he entered the chamber, the priest brought up the victims for him to make what was to be his last sacrifice. The omens were clearly unfavorable. After this unsuccessful sacrifice, the priest made repeated other ones to see if anything more proprietous might appear than what had already been revealed to them. In the end, they said that they could not clearly see the divine intent, for there was some transparent malignant spirit hidden in the victims. Caesar was annoyed and abandoned divination till sunset, though the priests continued all the more with their efforts. All right. The Senate rose in respect for this position when they saw him entering. Those who were to have part in the plot stood near him. Right next to him were Tilia Simber, whose brother had been exiled by Caesar. Under pretext of a humble request on behalf of his brother, Simber approached and grasped the mantle of his toga, seeming to want to make a more positive move with his hands upon Caesar. Caesar wanted to get up and use his hands, but was prevented by Simber and became exceedingly annoyed. That was the moment for the men to set to work. All quickly unsheathed their daggers and rushed at him. First, Servilius Casca struck him with the point of the blade on the left shoulder, a little above the collarbone. He had been aiming for that, but in the excitement he missed. Caesar rose to defend himself, and in the uproar, Casca shouted out in Greek to his brother. The latter heard him and drove his sword into the ribs. After a moment, Cassius made a slash at his face and Decimus and Brutus pierced him in the side. This must have been fucking just just so terrifying. While Cassius was trying to give him another blow, he missed and struck Marcus Brutus on the hand. Uh, Oh my God, some of these names, I don't know. Minicius also hit out at Caesar and hit Rubrius in the thigh. They were just like men doing battle against him. Under the massive wounds, he fell at the foot of Pompey's statue. Everyone wanted to seemed to have had some part in the murder and there was not one of them who failed to strike his body as it lay there until wounded as he says 35 times he breathed his last so 23 or 35 different accounts caesar's last words uh were apparently you too my child and not et tu brute 
as written in the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar. Uh, Caesar may have lived if this not if this wouldn't have happened. You know, 15, 20, 25 more years. He was in he was in good health. Caesar's funeral took place March twentieth, forty four BCE. Mark Antony, one of Caesar's deputies, gave a funeral oration and positioned himself as Caesar's rightful successor, but Caesar had named Octavian as his heir. Caesar was 55 when he was assassinated, he became a martyr after his death. His assassination led to another civil war uh, that would eventually lead to the fall of the Roman Republic and the rise of Caesar's grandnephew Gaius Octavius, Octavian, later Augustus Caesar, as the first emperor of Rome, the beginning of the Roman Empire. And that will take us out of this timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. And that is going to take us pretty much uh, out of this episode. Uh, Holy shit. This one wrecked my brain. I just, I wanted to do a better job than previous uh, sucks that were around Rome or like the Greek mythology or like the Norse mythology. Just for me, as far as like getting the pronunciation and understanding of the concepts. And there was just a lot to this one. It was the only one where I, like in my notes, I'll kind of like, you know, marching down, you know, writing things out. And then I, I can see where I'm at in my script. Like, oh, okay, like I'm, I'm halfway down uh, as far as like, the, you know, going over again, what has, you know, maybe Olivia in this case has done or, or Sophie. And um, it took me a couple days just to get halfway down of a episode that was a lot shorter in word count because each paragraph I would have to like, I had a, the craziest amount of tabs on my computer open and then I would have to shut them all down, reopen a bunch more to be like, wait, how do you say this word? How do you say that word? What do these words mean? Where is this stuff geographically located? Man, Gaius Julius Caesar, what a life. Excuse me, what a Roman daddy dictator. My God, uh, dude did get stabbed in the end. But before that, man, he like lived a lot of lives in one life, survived for so long in such a cutthroat world where to ascend to the top, I mean, you had to play the game and be good at like so many things. You had to be very intelligent, uh, very charismatic, you know, like so so strategic, so many different types of intelligence. I imagine you had to be very good with numbers to work as a magistrate and, you know, and organize so many things, good organizational mind, you know, to, to network like he did. He had to know, understand other psychology, all of that, um, you know, had to be very ambitious, very hardworking, had to appeal to the, the broader people for these elected positions, figure out who make his alliance with a kind of like a, like a chess type brain as far as that way. And then had to have a good military mind to command these people out in the field as a general. And then he actually would fight alongside his men sometimes and did that as a younger soldier. And also it seems like what was, you know, just good physically as a soldier, he was just fucking good at so much. It's insane. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've heard the phrase a lot. They don't make them like that anymore. Right. They really don't make them. <laughs> like Julius Caesar anymore. And you know what? They don't make him like fucking Derek skate, skate mullet anymore. I'm, oh my gosh. I am. I don't know what's going on with my, uh, with my body here. I'm trying to not make weird noise with my mouth. Uh, might have to suck that other super famous Roman another time right now. Let's hit a couple uh, key points about uh, Caesar again and learn a little bit more in today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, uh, Julius Caesar was born into a noble family, but they were not particularly powerful or wealthy. Uh, Caesar had to pave his own way in Roman politics, lived during a chaotic, violent time, used alliances, marriages, uh, affairs, bribes, gifts, eventually war to secure his power. Caesar was extremely cunning, uh, could be ruthless, uh, which is why he was so successful for so many years. And then at the end, ironically, it was his show of kindness that would lead to his death. Caesar gave clemency to some of his former enemies and allowed them to remain in the Senate and those enemies would conspire to fucking kill him after he became dictator for life. So, you know, good lesson. Uh, when you get into a position of power, you gotta kill a lot of people. Uh, no, n- number two, Julius Caesar divorced his uh, second wife, Pompeia, after a huge scandal in 62 BCE. Another politician, naughty daddy, Publius Claudius, snuck into a women's only celebration trying to do some creeping and some peeping. It seems like. Uh, Publius was prosecuted, but acquitted and Caesar divorced Pompeia because he believed his wife had to be above suspicion. That's still weird. There's got to be a lot more to uh, the real reason he divorced her, I think. Number three, after the start of the civil war, Julius Caesar chased Pompey all the way to Egypt. After Pompey was killed, Caesar became involved in the conflict between Queen, uh, Queen Cleopatra and her husband brother. 
uh, King Ptolemy. Caesar and Cleopatra started an affair, eventually defeated Ptolemy's army. The affair would lead to the birth of Caesar's son, Caesarian. And uh, Caesar never formally acknowledged his son and instead made his grandnephew Octavian, his adopted son, future emperor, his heir. Number four, when Julius Caesar was a young man on his way to study in Rhodes, he was kidnapped by fucking pirates. Uh, Caesar was insulted by the low ransom they demanded, offered to uh, raise more, according to uh, one source. While spending time with the pirates, he joked about killing them, and then he actually killed them. Uh, when he was freed, Caesar hunted his captors down, had their throats slit, many of them instead of having them crucified as a show of mercy. And number five, uh, new info. Let's talk about leap year. Caesar is considered the father of leap year. Before Caesar came to power, the Romans used a calendar system based on the lunar cycle, which dictated that there were 355 days in a year. The system was 10 and a quarter days shorter than a solar year, the amount of time required for the Earth to make one complete revolution around the sun. Although Roman officials were supposed to add extra days to the lunar calendar every year at their discretion in order to keep it aligned with the seasons, that didn't always happen. And as a result, the calendar was fucking confusing, kind of like their system of government. It was out of whack with the seasons and ripe for abuse by politicians interested in extending their terms in office by just pretending that the fucking dates were not moving like they were. After consulting with an astronomer whose name looks like someone threw up letters in a gutter, uh, Caesar implemented a new system, the Julian calendar, which went into effect in 45 BCE and was made up of 365 days in a year. The calendar was intended to be in sync with the solar cycle. However, because the actual solar year is 365 and a quarter days long, Caesar added an extra day, a leap day, every four years to make up the difference. Again, smart guy. Holy shit, did a lot. And there was so much he did that we didn't even cover. Time suck. Top five takeaways. A Julius Caesar, a Roman daddy, dictator, the hot daddy, has been a suck. Now I'm going to leave here and have some lasagna to honor him, and you're probably glad I didn't do that the entire episode. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you to Bad Magic Productions, the team, for helping uh, and making time suck. Thank you to Queen of Bad Magic, Lindsay Cummins. Woo, working her butt off this week. Thanks to the Art Warlock, Logan Keith. Also working a lot this week. The whole team's working a lot this week. Uh, producing, directing today. Uh, to the Suck Ranger, Tyler C., for helping with production. Thanks to Bit Elixir for upkeep on the Time Suck app. Art Warlock, uh, Logan Keith again for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com for helping run the socials along with our Suck Ranger and team managed by social media strategist Ryan Handelsman. Thanks to Olivia Lee for the initial research. Thanks to every member of our numerous online communities. Remember, time to be nice to one another on uh, Facebook, Reddit, and Discord. Or maybe I haven't said that yet. Uh, maybe I'm talking about that a bit. Sorry, my brain's all over the place right now. If I didn't address uh, some Facebook stuff earlier, I will in a little bit. Uh, next week on Time Suck, how about some true crime? How about we head to a place that doesn't, uh, you know, make me spend a full day, not kidding, trying to figure out how to pronounce about 500 words I'm not familiar with. We're going to suck the trash bag murderer, only California freeway killer we haven't sucked yet. Uh, we're, we've covered William Bonin, old Billy Gutterballs, and Randy Scorecard Killer Craft, Mr. Butt Socks. And now it's time to talk about the last remaining infamous freeway killer of Southern California, Patrick Wayne Carney. Patrick Carney, a man who was once known as the trash bag murderer. Murdered up to 32 victims from 1962 to 1967. And uh, Carney often picked up young men and boys who were out hitchhiking in different areas of Southern California. It's been a while since I listened to his name. So full disclosure, I believe it's Carney. Uh, if it's Kearney, I'll have that fixed next week. Unlike many serial killers, Carney did not get a thrill from causing extreme fear and pain before death. He shot his victims in the head when they weren't expecting it. He committed acts of brutality, such as necrophilia, dismemberment, even beating his victims after they were dead. Beating victims after death, all right? Uh, avoiding confrontation has been a common theme, or was a common theme throughout Carney's life. He was uh, bullied as a child, but instead of standing up for himself, he instead fantasized later about killing his bullies. After Patrick and his boyfriend got into arguments, he would go target innocent men and boys as a way to relieve the rage he felt. And instead of being arrested, Patrick Carney actually ended up turning himself in, along with his boyfriend, and uh, made a full confession. Instead of going to trial, he pled guilty to multiple murders twice. Who was Patrick Carney? How did his childhood influence his murderous actions as an adult? How did Carney maintain a long-term relationship, manage to keep his boyfriend from finding out he was a killer? Or did Patrick's boyfriend know everything? How was Patrick Carney uh, finally caught after more than a decade of murder? Like, why did he turn himself in? Uh, who were the young men and boys he killed? All that and more next week on Time Suck. And right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. 
updates. Get your time sucker updates. Uh, first update comes in from a dick starved sucker, Brian Williams. Brian needs some dick. I'll allow him to explain. He says, just finished sucking down episode 330, Amanda Knox, and felt unsatisfied. And then it hit me. Wow. A whole suck with no dick. Thanks, Dan. I was here for the dick, and he gave me a dickless suck. Where's the dick, Dan? Where's the dick? If you read this on the show, please add, fuck you, Noah Curry. He'll know what it means. <laughs> well, thank you, Brian. And fuck you, Noah Curry. I hope you liked all the dick you got today. I hope you like that daddy dick. And I hope you like that Philip K. dick. I uh, hope you're feeling okay after being dick starved for a week. I uh, don't need to die of uh, some kind of dick malnutrition or something. Okay, now let's hear from a real gay lord. Marvelous meat sack, Mike Gaylord. Uh, writes in with something that made me laugh and made my heart happy. Uh, Mike writes, long live the king and queen of the suck. Praiseable Jangles and hail Lucifina. Sorry for the long message in advance. This isn't so much an update as it is a thank you. Just finished the D&D, D- D&D suck. And holy shit, that was amazing. Thank you for showing me so much more about my favorite hobby. That's awesome. Also, if you ever want to play some magic, let me know. Anyway, on to my real message. Recently, I made the choice to move from California to Massachusetts, a big decision that truthfully, I don't know if I could have had the balls to do if not for this show. Sounds strange, but listening to you, follow your passions and live honestly with yourself is really goddamn inspiring. So thank you for that. Well, maybe I was too honest today talking about, man, these fucking episodes on historical things make me so nervous just because I know I... I feel like I feel like I don't have like the same powers narrative wise as I would for like a regular thing. But that being said, actually, I feel like I pronounce a lot of the words okay. Anyway, this is how in my head I always get. Usually I keep it inside, but I guess enough sleep deprivation is maybe you say some things. Uh, <laughs> I'll get back to you, Mike. Mike says my lovely girlfriend Lily and I made the trek via RV and time suck and scared to death. Oh, made the trek via R- RV. Excuse me, and time suck and scared to death were a huge part of our trip. We both love the spoopy as well as the learning. So when I started her on the episode of uh, Scared to Death, I was lucky enough to contribute to Ghost in the Basement. She was hooked. That's awesome. However, I noticed an odd phenomenon on our trip right after our first RV uh, breakdown in the Arizona desert, courtesy of none other than Roy fucking Disney. Uh, No, but seriously, every time we would get into a creepy rest stop while sucking, we would happen to be on an episode about a roadside serial killer. It kept happening with such frequency, she got unnerved, and this culminated with us stopping at a creepy rundown truck stop in Utah right as we finished the truck stop killer episode. Oh, that is horrific timing. This place was so unsettling. Mannequins that were a little too lifelike, and far too many of uh, and far too many out of date women's clothes on sale to make sense. Oh, for this type of business, yee. Uh, we got our asses out of there. Found much more wholesome accommodations for the night. Uh, we took a break from the suck for a couple of days, but as any of the rest of the cult can attest, we just couldn't quit you. Well, that's very nice. Now I'm in Boston. I've joined an amazing band, The Jack Lights. Cough, cough. We are on Spotify and YouTube. Facebook and Instagram. Cough. The Jack Lights. Shameless self-promotion. And I'm having the time of my life doing something I love in a place I truly feel at home. So thank you, Dan, uh, for, in a very roundabout way, giving me the courage to take on a massive challenge and staying with me as I start this journey. If possible, I'd love to give a huge shout out to my partner in crime, Lily, and my two new friends and bandmates, uh, Nalajia and Mike. Three of my favorite meat sacks on this earth. Love what you do, Dan. Five out of five stars. Definitely wouldn't change a thing. Keep it or suck. Can't wait for the next one. Hail Nimrod. Well, that's very nice, Mike. Hail Nimrod to you. Two mics in this band? Uh, they cracked me up about the true crime timing with your road trip. Hopefully, uh, fear helped you get across the country faster. And best of luck with the Jack Lights. Uh, I hope you do have the time of your life continuing to play with them. I listened. I thought about putting it in here, but I'm trying to get better about like, ah, you know, you ask permission about, I didn't want to just play a little snippet. I wanted to play a longer version. And I didn't want to get the way we publicly put these on YouTube, these episodes as well. Didn't want to get like a copyright thing or something. But but uh, Jack Lights, it reminds me of a band that I was a big fan of uh, long ago, still am, but became a fan of them long ago, Veruca Salt. Veruca Salt vibes for me, which is for me a big compliment. Uh, good shit, hail Nimrod. And now some more good news from a great meat sack, Jenna, who writes, hello, suck master. I will try and keep this short, but it, uh, but it's sappy story time. At the end of 2019, my husband realized something was off with me when I started sleeping through football games. We're a huge football family, and I never miss a Packers game. I've had a dramatic season this year and never miss any of my superstitions, uh, that bullshit. I was diagnosed with cancer two months later. I'm young, have three young meat sacks. This was a big what the fuck. Also, the cancer I was diagnosed with was more typical in a man over 50 that smokes. Uh, I was a female under 35 and have never smoked. When I was diagnosed, the tired started to make sense, but what came along with the cancer and treatment was a lot of memory loss. 
I can't remember anything from the 2019 and 20 and 21, 22 seasons of football and still struggle remembering easy words and have to describe them to my husband like a child, but he laughs and helps. Uh, uh, and I get to blame cancer for sounding like an idiot. Yay. Anyways, I am now cancer free and doing well. Yay. Fast forward to the Cult of the Curious Facebook page where someone asked if anyone wanted to be in a Cult of the Curious fantasy football league. I was super nervous because I couldn't remember much from the previous seasons. So, you know, player knowledge was not great, but the hubby encouraged me and we joined. It was an amazing group of meat sacks. So they don't, uh, and they don't know it, but they really helped me on a journey in healing. To top it off, I won the season and beat all the dudes, including my husband. Probably sounds cheesy, but that was a huge moment in my cancer recovery because it was like I had a part of myself back. And I would have, uh, not have had that if it had not been for you, Dan, and time suck. And I'm eternally grateful. This community is amazing. Really makes me feel like I belong. Thank you. P.S. This year's Dan Samber was my first. And it's amazing. The picture I saw most this year and used was you shirtless high as a kite. <laughs> Keep on sucking, Jenna. Jenna. Uh, well, thank you, Jenna. Uh, yeah, I forget, I forget how weird that Dan Samber thing is. And I look so crazy in that pic. I was so crazy in that pic. I probably just am crazy. Uh, I am so glad you're fucking back. Man, what a relief that must be. And then you won your league to top it off. Man, I was having a good fantasy year until the end, I, until like the last, till the first game of the playoffs. I thought I was going to win my league this year. I've been playing with the same guys for about a decade. I've never won. So clearly I'm not that great. But I had McCaffrey, Josh Jacobs, Ty- Tyreek Hill, Lamar Jackson, uh, Jackson, San Fran defense, right? Thought I was fucking moving on up in the, in the, in the playoffs. If Lamar would have kept playing, I think I would have won. Um, but I just, ah, he was out and I just never could get a good tight end. You know, just bounce around all season. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happier that you won, truly. And that is so nice to hear about the Facebook group. Uh, and this is what I was mentioning earlier. I have heard from more people lately that the Colts of Curious Fit of Five Stars group is uh, less good and more full of kind of like drama and, and cool kid kind of bullshit. And that bums me out, right? It should be more about stories like this. Please, if you're listening and you're in that, just be fucking cool. Just be fucking cool if you're in any of our groups. Don't be a dick. I know I have dark humor here. But uh, I like to think it's with heart, you know, some empathy. Uh, don't act like you're better than other members. That's not what anything here is about, you know. I, and I haven't had a lot of time to investigate this stuff myself, but I've heard from several people this is exactly what's been going on. And just please don't let our online communities become just some other internet dumpster fire, right? There's so much of that already. Just, just be cool. Create more stories like this one. The world has enough assholes in it al- already. You're never going to like regret later in life being like, you know what? Ah, I wish I'd been more of a dick. In that fucking Facebook threat. <laughs> but you are maybe going to like look back and be like, oh man, I'm so glad, you know, that I, that I helped out uh, somebody, you know, helped turn their day around, month around, you know, uh, year around, somebody like Jenna. That's what you, I hope, are focusing on in there. And I know most people in there are still great. So thank you for being great. And to those of you who are apparently not being great, you know, just fucking, just knocking it off. Uh. Why, why do you got a bit of it? Just go eat a piece of other meat lovers, a piece of pie, huh? Or maybe, maybe put some pesto sauce on your hands or on your nipples or rub it on your legs. Uh. Maybe take some olive oil and become a hot daddy. Just a hot daddy touching your hot daddy self and take it easy. I don't know. It'd be nice. Uh, last one. Bojangles needs your help. I uh, hope you listen to this one. This comes in from Sweet Sack, Ian Miller, who needs you to help find his fur baby. He writes, to members of the Bad Magic crew, my name's Ian Miller. I've been a massive fan of Dan's comedy for years. know you've heard this a lot, but uh, I put your albums on to help you fall asleep. That's the, go- that's the goal. That is the goal. Uh, something about your soothing timbre. Uh, actually, I found out about, or I think it's, yeah, t- smoothing timber. Actually, I found out about Dan after I became a fan of Chad Daniels and Dan's comedy. Came up on Chatty Daddy, Spotify Radio. I know you sift through tons of emails concerning all sorts of topics, but I feel like I need to ask for your help since your voice reaches so many meat sacks and I need all the help I can get. My dog is Uncle Buck. He's a six-year-old blue healer with a heart of gold, and he has recently taken flight from our home here in Hamburg, New York, just south of Buffalo. Took off on January 9th. We haven't been able to locate him. It's now 24 hours later as I write this. We have no leads. Uh, I remember you talking about your hikes with your kids with minimal material and unpreparedness. It's probably not a word. Uh, this, I'm reading like you saying that's, or that's probably a word. And it reminded me that Buck and I used to do the same. Like the time we camped for three days in five degree weather in a tent made for summer camping with barely any blankets and he would snuggle up to me for warmth. Aw, and we ate granola bars and would run around the woods for warmth. If you could please send out an APB to all your loving meat sacks and meatballs. <laughs> yeah, I get this a spice of meatballs and listen, I'm sure it'll reach someone here in the upstate New York region. I'm desperate. He's my best friend since he was a puppy and the thought of him not 
trying to snake my girlfriend's spot on the bed or sneaking a slice of pizza when no one is looking is driving me up a wall. We've contacted every local authority and posted on the website all the details for him. I feel like the response from the local community has been unbelievable. I'm catching up on the time sick episode. Just finished episode 300. Man, what a trip. Any hoodles, I wish I had someone to shout out to, but I happen upon your podcast myself and everyone I tell or hear or who hears me listening definitely questions my sanity. <laughs> Love it. You're the best and sorry, not sorry for the long email. Showbiz. I'll tell you what in Hollywood. Keep up the good work. Wouldn't change a thing. Three out of however many stars you think you need to beat the level. You're oh so faithful fan. Sorry, not a space loser yet. Ian, P.S. I do have flyers and so uh, and such made for him if you decide to promote this. And then this link. Yes, Ian, I'm so sorry. I hope by the time you hear this, you are reunited with Uncle Buck. Great John Candy movie, better dog name. Uh, I will be putting the link to the Facebook group you made to, you know, give people updates and pictures of this, uh, of your dog, Uncle Buck, uh, in today's episode description. So yeah, in today's episode description, there is a easy to find link. You can go check out Uncle Buck. Please do so. Nimrod decrees it. This meat sack needs our help. And Ian, please update us. And of course, of course, we wish you the best of luck. May Bojangles help you find Uncle Buck. And that is all for this week. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Please don't try and take over Rome this week. Beat sacks. I don't think it works the same as it used to. Please do keep your eye out for Uncle Buck and keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. A little maker of some music like I used to. This is the kind of music I you should always have been listening to. Huh? He's got the perfect amount of happiness, the perfect amount of Antonio Banderas, the perfect amount of the, uh, Julius Caesar. Everything is there. Keep it moving and all up, Mr. Yes, a spicy meatball.